if, if we saw it completely into ourselves, we would hate ourselves so thoroughly that we wouldn't get out of bed, we would all be killing ourselves. You do need a degree of illusion. You do need a degree of self-esteem and confidence, right? As people navigate the modern world, as they try to make their way through something like that, what are the tools and approaches um, that you recommend to people? Well, it's kind of what the subject, of, sort of what the daily laws is about. There's, there's two things. So, um, you know, the, the, the source of your power in life is your attitude towards the world. And in, in human nature, I kind of describe what I believe an attitude is. It's your lens. It's your way of looking at the world. Everybody's lens is different. You're not seeing things exactly as they are. You're seeing them filtered through how you look at them. Some people this are, is so important. Yeah. Some people are optimistic and adventurous. Some people are anxious and closed. And you could put two people in the same circumstances visiting the same place. The pessimistic, anxious person will find it unpleasant. People are rude. I don't like it. The adventurous, exploring type will find the circumstances very exciting. But it's the same thing. It's just you're judging it in a different way. Mm. So the lens that you want, you want a lens that clarifies things. You want a lens that's realistic, that you're trying to see things as they are, right? It's good to be excited, but sometimes if you're too excited and too adventurous, you're going to walk right up to that tiger and they're going to eat you alive. Sometimes you have to be a little bit wary of things. You have to see your circumstances for what, for what they are. In military terms, they call it situational awareness. You're very aware, crystal clear about who you are, about who other people are, about what the world is like. So that's the attitude that you want to craft for yourself in this world. And it's very difficult. As you've been saying very eloquently, the cards are stacked against you. A, because of how we're wired. You know, our brains developed 200,000 years ago in circumstances that certainly aren't the way things are now. So we're so there's kind of a, a gap there between, you know, how, how we're wired to think and what's going on in the 21st century. And B, we're dealing with technology that's making things harder. So you your goal in life is to become more realistic, to be able to step back and look at things as they are. And how do you get there is the question. So first you have to see that as your goal and it has to be important to you. And it has to be something that you want. And it's not just something that's cold and dry and scientific. Really fast. Why is that the right goal? Why is that the right goal? Yeah, to see. I agree with you. I just want to see how you explain it to people, why it matters to see the world the way that it actually is. Well, OK, imagine it this way. So there's yourself. Everything begins with you, right? You're filled with all kinds of illusions about who you are, about what you're good at, what you're bad at, what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are. If you're able to see inside of yourself with a degree of realism, you'll be able to understand, this is what I was destined to be in life. This is what I call my life's task. This is the career that's, that fits me, that suits me. So if you're able to have that realism, when you're 22 years old, you're not going to suddenly go off on this wrong career path that's going to make you miserable, make you an alcoholic by the time you're 30. You're going to have a degree of direction in life. It's incredibly liberating. It's incredibly powerful to be able to see inside of yourself and know what you were destined for and what makes you you. Other people, other people wear masks. They smile, but they doesn't, their smile doesn't mean anything. You, there are toxic people out there. It's not everybody. I don't mean to make you paranoid. <laughs> Maybe there's like 5% of the world that's truly toxic. Every single human being, I can guarantee you, has had to deal with these toxic people in a way that's painful. And you don't see them, you know, they're very tricky. These are people who've learned to disguise themselves. You're going to get sucked into all these dramas and traumas with these people. It can make your life miserable. Imagine that you had a realistic attitude and you could see through these people. You could catch, before you get involved with them, signs of that they might be one of these types. Another thing that's incredibly liberating, the world that you live in, there's a zeitgeist, there's a spirit of the times, there are trends, there's things that are going on right now in your career, in the world at large. And we're fed with so much bullshit in the media. We have no idea what's really going on. The ability to see this is where the world headed is headed. This is where business will be in two years. This is where things are going to be. These are the trends. 
the power. So the power to see inside yourself, the power inside to see other people, to see the world. You know, you're Superman if you can do that. If you can have a degree of that, the world is at your feet, basically. So, you know, I don't think there's any counter argument to that <laughs> where you don't want that kind of realism. And it's not this ugly thing. It's incredibly sexy because it's incredibly powerful, mm. right? So we've now come to the point, you and I, we agree that that's what you want. The person out there is going, yeah, I want that as well. Okay, Robert, that's fine. How do I get there? Aha. Well, you have to be patient. You have to know it's a process. You can't get ahead of yourself. You can't get ahead of your skis. It's going to take day by day by day by day. You have to build it up. You're working against your own nature. You're working against the times. So be patient. Be compassionate with yourself and learn to take these baby steps. And in the book, Daily Laws, I have a lot of different ways of attacking that. The main way of attacking it is a learning the ability, as we talked about earlier, to be able to detach yourself from the immediate events going on and to be able to look at yourself with a degree of dispassion and say, this is what I did, really did, uh, what really happened here. So just a simple example, Something kind of doesn't go the way you want it to, which will happen almost every day or every week, you know, with your children, with your spouse, with your boss, wherever. Okay, what is your normal reaction? Every single human, including myself, blame that person. They're not caring. They're not empathetic. They're an asshole. There's, they're, they're narcissistic, blah, blah, blah. Stop it. Stop it right now. Don't do that again. Step back and say, what did I do? Okay, if that person is toxic, why am I involved with them? There's something wrong about me. If that person got reactive and resentful and they had a bad tone of voice, something that I said, maybe there was something in me that was projecting kind of negativity. Maybe my own mood wasn't really, was kind of creating this atmosphere that made them react that way. Look at yourself instead of blaming other people. You know, these are parts of the process there are many others but yeah dude that is so huge people always so i have a saying that i like that most people fucking hate which is everything is my fault and i love it I, it's so useful so uh fault is a word that gives people i don't know emotional distress or something and so they don't like when i use that phrase um but what I like to remind myself is that if I did something different, I could get a different outcome. Right. And that's so powerful to me to not by blaming somebody else, by making it their fault, I give away all my power and there's nothing I can do about it. And now I'm sort of a victim of circumstance. But man, when you take 100% ownership and you look at your life and say, my life is an exact reflection of choices that I've made. Yeah. Now, if I want it to be different, then I just need only make different choices. Completely. And, and, and one of the things that, that's like that is if something went wrong, maybe and I'm to blame, just accept it. Just accept the fact that it happened. Don't try to change it, but just say that this has happened and I'm not going to fight it. And it's just my fate in life. You know, it's OK. Right. So the ability to accept things is also taking ownership of them. So if something bad happens and you can't really control it, because let's be honest, there are times that you can't control things. They're just going to happen. Who predicted a, a pandemic? You can't control that, right? So your first reaction is to get all pissy and go, damn it, why did it happen? Fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm a victim, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, and that's just going to make you more depressed, more inward, more harder to act in the world. Whereas if you say, okay, I can't control the pandemic. It's a terrible thing, but I'm going to roll with the punches. I'm going to accept the way things are. I'm not going to fight it. This is the way the world is. What can I get out of it? What kind of benefit? Well, maybe I can reassess my career. Maybe before the pandemic happened, I was just headed in this path and I wasn't, I was kind of blind. Maybe my, I'm not really happy with what I am. I'm not happy with my relationships, with my career. Maybe I need to reassess it. Maybe it's time for me to be alone and read books and, and study and, and learn new skills, etc. So the ability to, not, to accept things that you can't change and to see some benefit from them is also part of that. Mm. I want to go back to emotions. So we've talked about how emotions are incredibly powerful. You um, 
I don't think you use this example in the book, but it was certainly along these lines that if you damage the region of somebody's brain that deals with the emotional centers, they can't make decisions, no, which is absolutely just insane to me. Yeah. Um, and you also have a quote in the book, though, that I wrote down that I would like to share with people now. And for clarity's sake, I actually agree with both sides of this. So you've got the side that you talked about where if you damage the emotional centers of somebody's brain, they can't make a decision. And then you also had um, a quote, and I don't know why my the app is crashed that I have the quote in. I can paraphrase it if I can't get this out. Here we go. I think I can get it now. Um, nope, it's not opening. So the paraphrase of the quote is that emotions are essentially a disease looking for a remedy. And I was like, yes, yes, you can't just believe your emotions or maybe that's not the right way to think about it, but you can't just take them on board. And because right. I have this feeling, I'm going to act on it or right. it represents truth. Right. Help people understand. First, give us that. Like, what do you mean? How is it possible that my emotions aren't necessarily useful or true? And then we'll balance it with the idea of how important emotions actually are. Well, in, in, in a Japanese Zen way, your emotions are truth because you are feeling the way you're feeling, okay? So that's real, right? But it can stem from a very false source as well. Okay, so let's just go back to that example that I gave earlier of the young boy who was felt abandoned by his mother, right? And his whole pattern in his life is to be the one that's doing the abandoning so he's not abandoning himself. So in the moment that he's with this woman within this relationship that's been going on, he's starting to feel something's wrong with her. She's bad. She's she's not right for me. She's going to, you know, I better leave this relationship, right? He's not reacting on what she's doing. His emotions are not coming from what she, she could be perfectly fine. She could be totally loving. He's projecting onto her his own emotions. What he feels is genuine. He genuinely feels that something is wrong, but it doesn't come from the truth itself. Mm -hmm. It comes from some deeper, much deeper pain. So your emotions, you're feeling them, but the source of them, you have no idea what the source is, right? So, you know, you explode at somebody in your office tomorrow because of something, and then you don't realize that in the morning you were already put in a bad mood by something that somebody else said, and that kind of made you prone to like exploding later on in the day. You are seeing that other person that triggered you, but you're not seeing what happened earlier in the day that set the tone for it, that planted the seed for you being triggered, right? So you don't have access to the source of what's really causing your emotions. Now, I'll be honest, you're never gonna get true access to the actual source of it because there's something buried very deep inside. Who knows where it came from? Who knows how young you were? Who knows really the unconscious processes that were going on? Okay, so you're never gonna get at the core, the real truth, but you can get closer to it. You can, and you cannot react in the moment. You can say, if this, you're this young man who's trapped in this pattern, it's a very difficult to thing to go, but am I being, am, is it true that she's actually being like that? If I actually step back and analyzed her words, they're totally neutral. She's not being mean or vicious. She's not about to do, leave me, right? Or she's not betraying me in any way. It's totally neutral, right? And I often go through that process. I've been in a relationship for a long time where I get a little bit upset and angry and I'm blaming her and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I have to go back, like, takes a couple hours for the microwave to kind of cool down, right? And you go, no way, man. She, why does she feel the way she's feeling? Well, it probably comes from me, but I'm, I'm totally projecting onto her, right? So just the idea that you are projecting your emotions on the people, just the idea that you're reacting to something that's an illusion, it's a mirage, is liberating enough because it's gonna prevent you from doing stupid things. How many times I've had this problem, do you get angry and you send that angry email voicing all of your upset and displeasure, and then two hours later you go, shit, I wish I hadn't said that. Mm -hmm. I wish I hadn't revealed my vulnerability. I wish I had, maybe I was, it was, I overreacted, right? So the ability to, to write that email and then put it in the draft folder 
and never send it. And, you know, I have this thing in my, in my own uh, computer where in my email, that draft folder is getting larger and larger. It's got 12, it's got 20, it's got 80 things in it. That shows me 80 times I have put that thing into the draft folder and I have a degree of control. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the idea that there one that you don't have full access to everything that led you to react the way that you did and two that to some extent it's an illusion so you call it attitude i call it frame of reference i've given my entire um, professional life to the idea that frame of reference may be the single most important thing in the determining the outcome of your life uh, so looking at right now in much of the developed world, your zip code is the number one predictor of your future success. So were it your IQ, I could understand that. But the fact that it just is where you happen to grow up, that's really, really distressing to me. And so having worked in the inner cities a lot and seen up close what the problem is, you encounter people with incredible intellect. But as you watch them process the data, they're processing it through a filter. And that filter is what you call attitude. And when it encounters an attitude that isn't helpful, you get an outcome that's like a funhouse mirror. And you're like, what? the way that you're looking at this doesn't make sense in the following way. You have a goal and the way you're thinking about things, either your goal makes no sense, it won't optimize for fulfillment or joy, um, or you have a goal that makes sense and the way that you're parsing the data does not lead you to take actions that will actually move you towards that goal. Right. And so it becomes this really um, distressing question of, okay, somebody gets to adulthood, they have an attitude or a frame of reference that isn't helping them accurately, it isn't helping them process data in a way that will move them towards a useful goal. That's the, the cleanest, most truthful way to say it. So then the question becomes, what can you do to begin reformulating that attitude, that frame of reference in order to get you where you want to go? Do you think at all about the like, what is the atomized thing that makes up the attitude? For me, it's beliefs. Your frame of reference is is a reflection of I'll call it roughly 25 <laughs> beliefs that you have. Get those beliefs right you're A-OK. -okay. Get those beliefs wrong and you've got a real problem. But the atomized thing for me is a belief. What's the atomized version of an attitude for you? Well, I'm not quite sure I understand the beliefs part, but I, I'm trying to. Um, Do you I want me to almost, explain it? Hmm? Do you want me to explain it? Yeah. All right. So the most important one, so I've actually written down the 25 that I think make this up, but there's one that's really important. It's what I call the only belief that matters, which is that, in fact, you talk about this in your book. Mastery is essentially about this idea that if you put time and energy into getting good at something, you will actually get good at it. Right. And that thing has utility in the real world. Now, if you believe that, then you'll pick up the guitar and you'll start practicing. Right. You'll sit down at the typewriter and you'll start writing. Right. If you don't believe it, it wouldn't make sense to right. pick up a guitar. You're either good at it from birth or you're not. And so why would you bother? Right. That one belief will bifurcate your entire life because you're either going to lean into just the things you think you're already naturally gifted at and your right. life will be limited by whatever that is, or you will spend a massive amount of time and energy gaining mastery. Right. And those two, same person, but those are wildly divergent outcomes. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's 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 very true. Um, I don't know the atomizing. I think I might just basically being agree with you. I would maybe say the stories that we tell ourselves, mm -hmm. which comes down to the same thing, because I discovered in my meditation that the way the brain works is it's continually telling us stories about the world, about ourselves, about the way people are, and I don't mean stories in. It's literally what I'm saying. It's like constructed like a story. It has a narrative arc to it, right? This is what happened to me. And, and, and the story is constructed. And this is the result. And the, what the story I'm telling myself might not be the correct story at all, right? So being able to understand what really happened, what is the, actually the story that, that occurred there, is extremely important. And so you're hitting on the bedrock, which is extremely fundamental, which is do you believe that you're capable of change? Do you believe that good things happen when you go through a process of learning and taking steps? Do you believe, going back to your belief, 
that you can actually get out of your patterns. Because you can be fooling yourself. You can be bullshitting. You can be saying, yeah, I kind of do. But deep down inside, you don't really want to do it because, believe it or not, your bad patterns give you a degree of comfort. Right? It's something that you know. And to get out of them, you're suddenly thrust into the unknown. And that could be very frightening. So you could be holding on to these bad patterns. So the belief that I can change, I can actually do something different in my life. I can actually recreate myself. I can actually learn things. I can actually rewire my brain because the brain is incredibly plastic. Even at the age of 40, 50, you can change your career. You can learn new skills. You know, I've reached 60. I'm constantly learning as well. The brain is insanely plastic. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have the possibility to change yourself, to alter your patterns? That's probably the single most important thing right there. And to get people to believe that, as I said, there's two levels. There's the people who will shake their head, yeah, 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 they'll read mastery, but it won't mean anything to them because they're afraid of the change. They're comfortable with a degree of failure, I hate to say, because if you don't try things, you never have to deal with the responsibility, the pain of failure, right? So you don't really want to change deep down inside. You don't really believe in Tom's number one bedrock belief, right? You're kind of fooling yourself. So it's not a fairy tale. It's not a bunch of uh, a myth that we're creating. It's true that you have the power. The brain, if you just understood this one thing, that the brain is like a landscape. It's like a landscape out in the world that you see where things can be lush and tropical or they can be completely arid and dead. You create that landscape yourself. You create the brain that you have by the degree of how you're open to experience, by the degree of how much you learn, by the degree of how many different sources of information you take in. You can create this incredibly alive brain that's very creative, imaginative, and how much more fun will your life be if you're open and, and you let things come in and new ideas come in? So it's up to you. You're the one that's creating your misery. It's creating your patterns. It's, and it comes down to that bedrock one belief that you just mentioned. We consider ourselves human. Obviously, we're human beings. But I don't buy that definition. I think that we're actually animals, that we have an animal nature and that we have to become human. And we become human by overcoming some of these deep-rooted animal forces within us. Mm -hmm. These forces within us that we can't control, such as the fact that we can't control our own emotions, our own anger, our own frustration, or if we feel envy, or we're caught up in the emotions of other people, I call those forces, primal forces, human nature. And I have 18 of them. Mm -hmm. And they can create sort of negative patterns of behavior, the dark side of what we see in the news, etc. And we all have them ingrained in us because with the way we evolved millions of years ago served a very definite purpose for our survival as a species. But the savannas of East Africa is not the offices in Silicon Valley or 21st century America. The world isn't the same. We are not built to adapt to this new technological environment we're in. We still have that lizard brain, those animal parts of our nature. So my book is designed to confront you with human nature so you can begin to overcome it. So for instance, law number one is about how we're basically irrational creatures. We think that we're rational, but really our emotions govern us. We feel something before we ever have an idea or think it. We have to become rational through this process that I lay out in my book. So I don't mean to say that we're negative because humans are obviously incredible. Look at what we've created. It's, it's an outrageous if you think about who we were millions of years ago and where we are now. We're obviously capable of incredible achievements. We're also the most brilliant social animal on the planet. We're capable of cooperating and working on teams to a level that no other animal has ever reached. So there's obviously another side to the story. But to become greater, to become truly human, we have to overcome these forces that I lay out in the book. What are some of the other primitive forces that are driving us, especially ones that people might not be aware of? Well, 
I think we're kind of aware of it, but we don't see it in the same light. So for instance, we are built to constantly compare ourselves to other people. We're always thinking of what the other person has and how we are in relation to them. Are we getting as much attention as that other person? It started off when we were children. Are we getting more attention than our siblings from our parents? So we're continually comparing ourselves in rank, in power, in status to the people around us. And this is deep force within us and it's constant every day, every moment. You don't realize it, but you're going through that. And social media, it completely exacerbates this tendency in human nature. And it's the source of envy, which I have a whole chapter on in my mm -hmm. book. So that's one force that I, that I talk about and it has, I try and show the roots of that, you know, in our evolution. Another is the contagiousness of emotions, which is extremely powerful. We tend to think of ourselves as autonomous human beings that we're independent, that we, I feel affection or anger or frustration on my own. We don't realize how deeply we are affected by the emotions of the people in a group. This is the, the viral effects. Emotions are extremely contagious. And I explain in the book, there was an evolutionary reason for that. Before the invention of language, we humans had to be able to communicate to one another through just picking up the moods of other people. And if there was a threat to our group or our tribe, the ability to feel fear and anger together bonded us and helped us survive. But that doesn't serve much function in the world today where viral emotions can be very dangerous and very, we see a lot of that on social media. So those are two of forces, you know, I could mention there, there are several others. Mm. So you've said that you often write from a place of anger. I do. What was the <laughs> anger that was driving this book? Well, I, I tell you, you know, I just think I'm really worried about people nowadays. So in mastery, my worry was <clears throat> people no longer knew how to build things, mm. no longer understood the process for becoming great and excelling at some craft or field. But now my worry is that people are so immersed in their smartphones and their technology that they don't understand people. They're not observing people. And this has been documented in studies that young people, for instance, levels of self-absorption and narcissism have been growing steadily since the 1970s. We are the preeminent social animal on the planet. Our survival depends on how we relate to other people, whether we understand them on some level. And I find a lot of people are increasingly in the world are really bad at observing just basic elements in human psychology. The position I'm in now, I'm a consultant to a lot of very powerful, famous people. I'm not gonna mention any names, but people fly me out to consult with CEOs, political people who are very powerful and even in other countries. And the number one problem I find that they have is an inability to understand the people they're dealing with. They hire the wrong partners. They hire the worst assistants who end up ruining their lives. These are people who are technically brilliant. They understand their field. They understand marketing, etc. But they don't understand basics about the people around them. And they make terrible hires or they marry absolutely the wrong person for them in their lives. Their emotions, are, you know, their personal relationship bring them down. So this is like our Achilles heel, and I think it's gotten worse in the world today. So my anger was that people are so focused on technology, but that we need to focus much more on human nature, on understanding people. That's the primary skill that you need in life. I found it really interesting. So I'm sort of the, um, I get a little mischaracterized as the blank slate guy. And admittedly, I do want to believe that we're blank slates, but I don't believe that. I don't think that we are blank slates. And I think that there is a certain amount of human nature that's really baked into things. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty funny in your book was like the biggest um, part of human nature is that we deny that there is human nature. I thought that was wonderfully ironic and terrifyingly true. And 
I want to know, like, how much of this is stuff where we tease out? Because you said the purpose of the book is to give you a sense of who you are, so that you can change who you are. But yeah. without that self awareness, without going through the process of learning this stuff, yeah. you're just never going to be able to make that change. Right. So, okay, operating from the thesis that your book is designed to give me that level of self awareness, as I go through the process of trying to tease out who I really am, which yes. is a fascinating journey that your book takes people on if they're <laughs> willing to acknowledge right. when they see themselves. Um, how much of this is truly like just uh, you were born that way and how much of this is early childhood development? Well, um, I have a chapter on character, which is an extremely important chapter. And what I'm trying to get at in there is that there is something deeply ingrained in each individual person, a particular individual nature that we all have. And that causes us to go into compulsive patterns of behavior. I have this problem myself. I notice each time I write a book, I'm telling myself, I'm going to make this book short. I'm not going to ruin my health. I'm not going to do so much research. And every goddamn time I still go through the same process, I can't break this pattern. Okay? And everybody has them. Where does it come from? Some of it comes from our DNA, from our genetics, things we can't control that we've inherited from our parents. Some of it comes from our early attachments. And some of it comes as we get older and we interact with teachers and mentors and various people who create a certain way we view ourselves. If people keep telling us that we're not really worthy, that we're not good students, we internalize that and we end up becoming like that. So it's a mix of things. You know, Each person has a mix of these qualities and you have to kind of un untangle the various strands and you're right, what I'm saying is you're a mystery to yourself. You don't know who you are. You have patterns of behavior and you're not even understanding that. You don't know why you're angry. You think you're angry because that person said something mean to you or did something wrong. But in fact, your anger probably stems from things from deep, deep within from your childhood. And you're not reacting to that person, but to actually your parents and what they didn't give you. You know, the, the, the the origin of wisdom, according to the Greeks, was know thyself, right? And I believe that very firmly, that knowledge about who you are is an end in itself and will help you in so many ways become that human being that I think we all have the potential to become. So talk to me about self-awareness and how it impacts biases. Well, um, you have to see this is my books I try to be as practical as possible. I don't want to get academic. I want you to be able to actually use this knowledge. So I'm a great believer in baby steps in learning how to do things on a daily basis. So normally when we feel an emotion or we have an idea, we don't examine it. We just assume that's that's, you know, it's just natural. We came up with that on our own. I want you every single day to be examining yourself and to look at yourself why do I have that idea? Why am I feeling this sudden emotion? And it's not easy. It, takes, it can take time and it can take a degree of introspection that you're not comfortable with. But if you begin to look at yourself and question, why do I feel this way? And examine it and look at perhaps other sources of it, then you can begin this process of understanding instead of just simply accepting that you feel or have this, this certain idea. So when I write the book on human nature, I admit that I have a negative bias towards human nature. I tend to see the dark side in people. I tend to see their manipulative side, what they're trying to hide. That was the source for the 48 Laws of Power. That was the anger I felt then, that people weren't being honest about how manipulative they can be. So. Um, I recognize that I have this bias. I recognize that that's who I am. Instead of thinking that, well, I'm just brilliant and my ideas are always correct, I question it and I question, is my negative bias towards human nature, is that reality or is it just me? And maybe it's just me because of my, the way my parents are. You know, my parents were kind of anxious and worried about a lot of things and I internalized that and maybe that gave me my negative view on people. So I question it and I say, maybe it's not real. Maybe I need to read books that tell me the other side of the story. And there are plenty of books, you know, that say that humans are great. So question yourself. 
Stop assuming that everything you do is so brilliant and smart and, and right. And imagine that maybe your ideas don't come from yourself. Maybe you're feeling uh, some political anger or whatever it comes from the fact that you're just assuming it from other people. You're following things on Facebook and you're getting swept up in some viral emotion. You want to think that you're completely independent and autonomous, but maybe you're not as independent as you think. So how do you want people to use your book as a tool as they go through? What exercises do you want them to do? Because I think some of a lack of self-awareness is not just a, I don't want to do the work, the introspection. It's a not understanding the process of what introspection is. Well, some of it also is denial. Some of it also is a block that people have to look at themselves because it, it, is, it is a little bit a confrontation with reality. But as far as the process is concerned, it's, it's a daily thing. So first of all, the first and most important thing that you have to do is to, is to come to admit, it's almost like an AA thing, that you have a problem. If you go through life thinking you don't have a problem, that you know who you are, that your relationships with people are fine, that everything is hunky-dory, then you're never going to be able to even begin to go into the process. So admit you have a problem. Admit you don't understand the people you deal with. Even your spouse or your children, they're mysteries to you. You don't really know what they're thinking. So admit that first. When you admit that, now you're motivated to try and learn. There, there are little steps you can take. I won't go through all of them. But the first thing is, if you take your, your, your wife or your husband, if you say to yourself, I don't really understand them. I think I do. But a lot of the times when you think you understand them, you're just simply projecting your, onto them your own emotions. Step back and say, today, I'm going to observe her, her, let's just say from my point of view, in a different way than I normally do. And I'm going to look at her nonverbal communication because I'm a big believer in nonverbals. And today, I'm going to glean one truth about my wife or spouse or partner that I had never noticed before. And I'm going to try and see, perhaps get to the point where I can begin to understand her perspective. So if, for instance, there's an argument or a disagreement, here's another instance where you step back and you go, stop being so self-righteous and maybe try and take the step of understanding her point of view. So, you know, so these are sort of baby steps that you take in, in life. You can use this in your office where you think you, you know your colleagues, but you don't know them, and they might be having thoughts about you that aren't very pleasant, that you don't want to confront. Step back and start observing them. And I have many, many examples in the book about how lessons on how you can start observing people, observing their body language, seeing the subtext behind their words, you know, seeing their patterns of behavior. You know, for instance, you'll notice sometimes we all go through this, that when we see our boss, we get a kind of body language and a nervousness that's it's unusual. But when we see somebody else like a friend, suddenly our face lights up and we're much more relaxed and happy. All people are like that. So you want to see how somebody reacts to you when you meet them, when you come up to them, and how they react to other people. And notice that there's a great difference when they see you and suddenly they're very nervous around you or they're very excited. That will tell you a lot about yourself and about them. Mm -hmm. You're not being observant. You mentioned Milton Erickson before we were talking about him, how incredibly observant he was. His, what he was fascinated with was how incredibly unobservant people are. Let's go deeper into Milton Erickson, who is a shared fascination for you and I. I love and Milton. seeing him in your book, was very excited, and you give like this blow by blow account of how he comes to what is really almost a superpower. His ability to read nonverbal communication is beyond powerful, but the way that you tell the story, it makes it sort of self evident how he develops that. Walk us through, you know, what happened when he got struck with polio, how he leveraged that, what some of those realizations were, and then how we can all train ourselves. Um, and, and if you can touch on like what he learned about the word no. Like, I found that really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, Milton Erickson is an amazing figure. He's the person who created basically hypnotherapy and was the main inspiration behind NLP. And when he was about 18 years old, he suddenly got polio. 
And as his polio spread, his entire body was, was paralyzed. <clears throat> Even the only thing that wasn't was his eyeballs. He could move, he could look at people, he had some ability to see, move his eyes a little bit. And so imagine, I can imagine myself, I have a very active mind. Imagine you're paralyzed in bed, you can't read, you can't watch anything, no television, no entertainment. People can read you stories, basically. But how incredibly bored you'll become and how frustrating and you can't do anything for yourself. You know, you'd go crazy. So what Milton Erickson did as he was in that state and he was living in his house and people were visiting his him, is he decided he would observe people on a much higher level. Now he couldn't say anything, he couldn't communicate because his mouth was paralyzed as well. So all he could do was observe and observe people closer and closer. And so he noticed that as, that ha as he progressed in that, there's, a, there's, there's this second language that people speak. And this language is nonverbal. It is in gestures, it is in tone of voice, it is in just your po body posture. And slowly, over months and years of being paralyzed in this position, he literally mastered this second language. He could tell from the way his sister moved her hair like that or moved her head that she was feeling some resentment towards her other sister. He noticed, as you said, that there were like five different forms of no. That someone could say no, I don't want that apple, when they were offered to it, but they really meant, yeah, I really do want that apple. And so he noticed that there were all these different variations of no, depending on the tone of voice. He could hear people in another room talking about him, and through that, the tone of their voice, he could understand what they were really trying to say about him, and the subtext behind the words that people have. And so as people talk and they use words to conceal what they're thinking, their bodies reveal what they're actually thinking behind the words, through their nervousness, their tone of voice, their eyes. The, the eyes and the mouth tell you incredible amounts of information. Milton Erickson mastered this language. And as he got older, he used this in his therapy where he would have patients enter his room. He became a, a psychoanalyst. And he deliberately placed his desk at one end of the corner so they would have to walk into the room. And he could understand from the way they walked and their gait, whether they were nervous, whether they were excited, whether they wanted to change their lives or not. He was so brilliant at it that people later in life, people thought he was psychic. He could literally read your thoughts. It was unbelievable. So the point of the story was that humans have this ability to, under, to master the second language. Put yourself in the position of our earliest ancestors. I mentioned this earlier. They don't have language, yet their survival depends on getting along with the group and knowing like you're hunting and where, where is that leopard? What's going on? And you, but you can't say anything. You don't have language yet. So your ability to pick up fear in the eyes of a fellow group member or to pick up excitement, your survival depended on it. So I maintain that our ancestors were virtually psychic in their ability to attune themselves to the nonverbal communication that people are constantly emitting. So the idea in this book is we humans are all constantly emitting information about our real emotions. It comes out nonverbally and you're not picking up these signals. You're so focused on people's words that you're missing this other reality, which is so incredibly eloquent. And I try and instruct you in the book about how you can become a superior observer of this. I find it very, um, I don't know the right way to frame this other than to say that while I wouldn't wish a stroke on anybody, the fact that you in particular are able to bring back the lessons from that, um, what are you doing on a daily basis to get those um, joyful moments despite all the restrictions? Well, I have to be honest, it's a struggle. You know, some days I'm very successful and I feel very excited and happy. Some days it's like I've got Tourette's syndrome. I'm just walking around going, fuck, 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 fuck. 
so upset. Mm. I'm so frustrated. And so I'm daily having to struggle with myself. And um, so whenever I feel that level, the frustration is very easy to explain. Imagine that you can't really button your shirt, that your left hand is so weak that you, it, it takes you forever to button your shirt. To get dressed in the morning takes like 10, 20 minutes to like get my vitamins off the shelf is this kind of ordeal. I can't type. So just my hands. So you take for granted, you out there, you take for granted your use of your hands. Brother, I can tell you, the hand or sister, that hand is a miracle. You have no idea if you lost one of your hands, what a nightmare it would be. Mm. Don't take it for granted. The fine little things that your hands can do because I can't do them anymore. You know, I can't walk in a normal way. I'm always kind of losing my balance. I have to hold on to things, etc. Like So the frustration is every single day. There's a tenseness. Like, am I going to fall? Am I going to drop this? Can I hold on to this? Can I get this done? And it builds up until your, your body starts getting tense before anything ever happens. So I have to fight that. And I have to feel it before it happens. And I have to go through kind of a mantra of, you are getting better. You're just not aware of it, Robert. It's something you can't see. It's so gradual that it's going to take three or four more years. Calm down. It's not like it's this is going to be you forever, et cetera, et cetera. Other times I don't believe my mantra and I get upset. So it is a daily, daily struggle. And I can go through weeks where the struggle seems great and I'm fine. And then suddenly I'll fall through this hole where I'm just like, damn it. You know, I see people walking by on the street, taking a hike. Just three years ago, that was who I was. It's not who I am now. I'm like a different person. Mm. I want to cry, you know. I can't do the things that gave me pleasure. So sometimes I can't control it when I see things in the world that remind me of my past life. But I had to find compensation. So I can't take a hike up into the beautiful Griffith Park, which is very beautiful with incredible woods up there. It's something I love doing. I can't ride a bicycle, but I found a, a recumbent bike. It's basically a tricycle, a, a souped up tricycle, right? But I got the top of the line trike, recumbent trike, right? The best you can get, the fastest, the lightest weight one. And now I'm able to go up these incredible hills, hills like obviously slower than normal people, a normal bike, but I can go up the biggest hill you can imagine. And I do it and I go up into the hills and the woods and I'm alone and it's my therapy. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's ephemeral, that it only lasts for like half an hour, an hour. I suck every second of joy out of that, being in the woods that I can, being alone and being away from everything. So I've had to find compensations, you know. I had to look at the little things around me and find insanely beautiful things about them. Also, I had the kind of stroke that damages the right side of the brain, which has an effect on you in many ways. But the main thing is it you can't your right side of your brain isn't communicating to the left side. So your left arm, your left leg isn't getting signals from the brain. That's why I can't do the things I can't mm. do. But it saved my cognitive abilities. So if it's hit in my left side, which people have strokes, that's the kind of people that lose the ability to talk, Oof. that can't really think straight. I wouldn't be able to write a book. So every day, three o'clock, if I'm lucky after I've exercised, I sit down, I'm with my sublime book, with my notebook, I'm in heaven. Nobody bothering me. Please don't call me. If you call me, I'm going <laughs> to cuss you. I'm going to get the fuck out of my hair. I'm only working on my book. I am the happiest little baby in the world, you know, because that book is saving me. It's, it's my therapy. So I've found compensations. But, you know, we talked earlier about patience. I'm patient in some sense, you know, to write a book, but I'm also impatient in another sense, right? I'm impatient with my body, with my physical things. I want to be able to do things now. And so I've had to learn a, a different form, like a meta patience, a, a whole other level of patience. And, I, and, and it's a work in progress. That's all I can say. Talk to me about hope. How is it 
you know, as you do physical therapy and try things and you make some progress, but not as much as you want, how do you continue to renew your hope? It's, it's the most hardest thing. And it's the most important thing I can tell you. Um, because the moments that I don't feel hope, I'm just kind of ready to give up. You know, I mean, what's the point of this? So I have to continually rekindle it. And it's been a roller coaster ride because in the beginning, people will say, Robert, you've got to try this. You've got to try um, hyperbaric chambers. You've got to try this, this acuscope that this guy has. You have to try the stem cell research. You have to go this and that. I get my hopes up. Oh, all right. I'll spend thousands of dollars on this new form of therapy. I do it. A little bit of change, but nothing really happens. Mm -hmm. Then my hope sinks. It's like, um, I don't know what the expression is, uh, a god that dies every single time this happens is how I explain it. Like I had this belief in something mm -hmm. and then it got burst. It's very painful. And so, you know, people are constantly suggesting new forms of therapy. My hope rises. And I have to be able to control that and know that there is no quick fix on this. The actress Sharon Stone had a stroke very similar to mine right. at an age, at a comparable age. And I actually was going to try and contact her. It sounded like we had very similar experiences. She wrote that it took her seven years Whoa. to get back to a normal kind of life. I've done three years so far. So I have to tell myself that there are no quick fixes. And she herself did every form of therapy imaginable. Mm. And believe me, people are well-meaning and they come and they say, Robert, you gotta try this, you gotta try that. I've gotten to the point where like, please don't tell me that anymore. You know, I don't believe in quick fixes. I have to do this day by day by day. I have to retrain my body, mm. you know? So I'm trying a new form of therapy right now. It didn't instantly give me results. Um, it's something very interesting. It's based on Feldenkrais. Fascinating new way. What is Feldenkrais? It's a whole different way of looking at your body. And I find it fascinating. It's just not hyper designed for a stroke victim. But I think somebody will someday. It's based on this idea that the body is a whole unit, right? So you can't isolate the parts. The body works as a whole. It's in a complete organic whole. So if you have back pain, it doesn't stem from your back. It stems from your pelvis. It stems from your hamstrings. It stems from how you move your legs. Mm -hmm. It stems from your neck, the whole body. And we have built intentions all over our body. We use muscles that we don't need to use, right? So every time you're about to lift something or do something arduous or even psychologically do something arduous, the chest muscles tense up as if that will help you somehow get over what you're doing. But you don't need the chest muscles. They're not designed for that. You're using muscles that you don't need that are expending energy. If only the muscles that were necessary to do the job were firing, everything would work so much better. So the Feldenkrais, this is called the Anat Banil method. She was a student of Feldenkrais, is... There's an ideal of the body that I can sense when I do the lessons where you're on a whole other level. You're like only using the muscles that are necessary. You're moving with this kind of grace and elegance and efficiency that wasn't existing before. All the bad habits with our necks, our shoulders, mm -hmm. and, and the psychological stuff that they put you through. It's very powerful. It's just not geared specifically for a stroke victim. Then I'm doing another form of therapy. Tom, you have no idea how boring this physical therapy is, right? So when I'm used to exercises that's kind of fun, I, even lifting weights can be fun because you see your muscles mm. building, right? You feel your heart pounding, swimming, running. It's all kind of fun. This is like little micro movements with your knee, with your leg. It's so boring. So I have to like put music on. I have to watch the ball game. I have to do something to distract myself. So, I mean, I'm going through all the, the weeds here of, of my process, but. That's, well, so what I find interesting about it is just inevitably all of us are gonna go through something or have gone through something and how we deal with that crisis is yeah. so telling. And the fact that you've, you know, we were talking before we started rolling 
that typing is hard. And so here you have an author and you've taken away one of the ways by which they get that out. And as somebody who's thought, so I'm a late bloomer and I have this real sense of wanting to make the most of the time that I have. Late blooming meaning when? How, how, how late were you blooming? The, the skills stack, right? So I feel like I'm getting better, but like when I think about things that I'm, I'm 45 now and I'm only just now getting confident in certain so abilities. Younger. Thank you. What's your secret? Diet, okay. exercise, sleep, meditation. Okay, that really, cool. there's nothing magical. I do yeah, not okay. come from great genes. Okay. I'm very sad to report. Okay. Um, so when I think about the things that are just now beginning to click for me and I'm like, oh my God, like I see even people on my own team that are 10 years, 15 years ahead of where I was, it's very easy to be jealous right. that, oh my God, you have this insight, you know, so many years before I did, and you right. know, how much more time will you be able to make use of? But very quickly you realize it's not a fruitful way to approach it. And so I, this was years ago now, maybe five years ago, I did this thing to celebrate, I forget how many subscribers we had on Facebook or YouTube or something. And I went live for 24 hours. So I was wow. on camera for 24 hours without all I, the only breaks I took were to pee. Wow. And then three days later I was in England and I gave a speech and um, I didn't have a microphone. And so for nine hours, I was essentially yelling um, to this large crowd. And then I woke up and my voice was weird and it didn't go away, didn't go away. And I felt like I had a lump in my throat. And then like when I would turn my head, I could feel something click and I was like, ooh. So then of course I'm like, is this cancer? Like, what is this? And you start thinking, what would happen if I lost my voice as a leader? even just in business, forget being on camera, my ability to persuade, to um, galvanize a team, to get people excited and focused, I have learned to do it all with my voice. And so I started thinking, what would happen if I lost my voice? And it's like, okay, like I would definitely have to mourn. I would have to go through a period where it's like, I'm just gonna feel badly for myself for a while. Um, but then it's like, you, you make use of what you have. But it really made me take stock of, I had taken my ability to speak for granted for at the time, whatever, 39, 40 years. And now I don't, and now I'm very thoughtful. And so getting the kind of insights of the struggle that you're having, um, it's very useful. Yeah, I mean, it's all, unfortunately, it's inevitable for everyone. You may not, you may not go through a stroke, but you're going to deal with some kind of adversity, where the physical things that you took for granted are taken away from you. That just happens. It's the nature of life, and it can occur at any age. Um, so these are skills that you have to develop. And you, but the main thing I try and tell people is, I don't know how much how how powerfully I can I can implant this in your brain. But do not take for granted what you have right now. Because I can tell you, I did. I thought I'd be swimming the rest of my life. It was my life. It meant so much to me. Do not take for granted what you have now. When you're doing these activities, feel insane amounts of gratitude that you have a body that can perform these things because it could be taken away from you tomorrow, right? So that's the number one thing I want to tell people. It's not to get anxious and paranoid and fearful about the future, that's not gonna help you at all. You need to have a joyful life, a happy life. Mm -hmm. So, but look at what you have right now and look at the marvels, the things you don't realize, as I said, what your hands and legs and brain can do. It's absolutely miraculous and awesome. So just look at it that way. And then if these things happen, we are creatures that are able to accommodate ourselves to things we can be very good at that, right? You know, we find compensations for it. I mean, the other thing, you, you know, being 45, I was a, even late, more a later bloomer than you, I think. I mean, I didn't start writing the 48 laws until I was about 36, 37. You were probably, you were doing things well before that, if I remember. From a business standpoint, yeah. Yeah, It your story of late blooming is really extraordinary. Like, it's yeah. amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, um, so 
you know, until I was 36, I was pretty lost. I wasn't like starting a great business like Quest and all these other things. I was uh, a struggling, depressed, penniless screenwriter in Santa Monica <laughs> in a one bedroom apartment, you know, in this kind of rundown apartment building. Right. And then suddenly my life changed. So I'm a, as late a bloomer as you can get. But there's a reason why you bloom late if you bloom at all, which is it comes at the moment that you're ready for it, mm. right? So people who are 32, 33 that you might be envious of, they're not ready to create what you're able to create now with all of your experience and all the things you've learned with all the businesses you've started, all your entrepreneurial skills, all the people you've interviewed. You have that rich landscape of a brain that we're talking about. That 32 year old, they may have more, exp you know, some more experiences than you had, but they have nowhere near the ability to, to, to exploit it like you have it now, you know? So yeah, I like to run the brain in a vat experiment and that I find it really useful. And every time I explain to this, this to people, I never see the sort of spark in their eye that I want to see. But for me, this has been really liberating, which anytime I find myself thinking, you know, woe is me or whatever, I say, hold on. Imagine for a second that all of this is just the frame of reference that you need. Literally, you came into existence in this moment. You're a brain in a vat somewhere and all the trauma, sadnesses, um, failings, all of that is the context to your point about emotions is the emotional context that becomes necessary for you to make decisions and move forward. Right. So rather than lament it, just like make sure that you're making decisions that propel you forward. And even though I don't believe that, I think my life was lived and it is exactly what I think it is. And the traumas and all of that are all real and they're just a part of me. But there's something about running that thought experiment that allows me to recontextualize the purpose of you know, whether it's lamenting being a late bloomer or my big lament, which you talk about in the book, um, you know, just not being as smart as I want to be. Like when I see people that can really process data quickly, oh, I get so jealous to this day that everybody has their thing. That's my thing. And uh, but realizing that with if you look at it from just a slightly different angle, all of a sudden it's like, all right, I'm good. You process data very quickly. You think that because you're talking to me about subjects that I've already thought about. Oh. If you were talking to me about a subject that's totally new, uh, it it certainly startles me every time how long it takes me to really like I would never be a debater on national television. I will just tell you that. Well, uh, so that does not speak to my strength. That's a very specialized skill. That I wish I'm, I had. Oh, no, really? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I've been around. I've been at social gatherings for the be uh, uh, this one person I know who has these meetings with the smartest people around and these these whippersnappers who are 25 26 and they're doing what you're doing there they've got all this information all the snappy stuff all these anecdotes go, damn where's that coming from <laughs> you know i'm just not like that animal right i'm slow mm. i'm deliberate i need to read about i need to process things and i go slowness is a good thing right they may be a whippersnapper but they may be not being able to like go into depth about anything. They're on the surfaces. They're kind of regurgitating ideas and beliefs that are kind of on the surface, that they're good at, at fooling people, but they're not going into the depths. People who go into the depths are slow, are deliberate, take time to think, who are more thoughtful, you know, and are more patient. So I wouldn't want to be that fast, you know, that high speed processor that they have, because I don't think that's where great things come from. It's interesting. That's a very good way to think about it. The harder way to think about it, though, <laughs> is to say, what if they really are just better than me? And now facing that. So the one that I always pose to people is I want you to imagine that someone you really respect doesn't respect you. That's hard. Now, if you can deal with that, like if I can stare nakedly at my own inadequacies, compare myself to somebody who just objectively is better at something that I want to be good at. So yeah. not not even discounting, like sure, there might be trade-offs, but can I look nakedly at somebody who is truly better than me at something that I want to be great at and still find joy and fulfillment in my life? That to me is like, that's the question. And so I've tried to get myself to a place, you talked earlier, I thought this is so brilliant, that 
your ego gets knocked down, but you have these mechanisms like a thermostat to reset your sense of self. That to me is the juice. You have to get good at that. And so yes. I used to really get in emotional twists over this stuff, but I have learned some very useful techniques to keep my emotional equilibrium. So I can say that I'm envious of people that have that without diminishing my sense of self or you know losing time and energy to worrying about it anymore. I used to, I don't wanna paint that this was easy, but that to me is, is the trick. Okay, but I still think your process of that they're so much better than me is a bit of an illusion or the reason for being envious. Okay, so you combat your envy, all right? But I'm trying to tell you, I don't think there is a reason for your envy in the first place. So people, they're not as brilliant as you think they are, right? People are good at faking things generally, right? And then maybe they're not as happy as they seem to be. Maybe they're alive. You're just seeing them on television or with their snappy answers, but they're covering up everything else that's going on underneath, right? You're not seeing the full picture there, right? So there's generally, your envy is always kind of exaggerated because you're beginning from a place of insecurity. You're beginning from a place of inferiority where you're primed to feel envious of people like that. So it's almost starting with you. You're almost projecting onto them their superior qualities, you know? And I find myself doing that. Yes, there are people who are better than me. I certainly know that. There's a writer I deeply admire who passed away recently. He's much more of an academic and intellectual. His name is Roberto Calasso. He was an Italian writer, wrote a lot about ancient Greece. That guy is far more brilliant than I am. He's amazing what he wrote about. I'm in awe of it, and I really mourned his passing. But I think it's important to feel for that, not envy, but just disinterested in admiration for people who are superior to you and to recognize it. I know there are plenty of writers and thinkers who are superior to me. And if they are genuinely that way, they're not bullshitting, all, my hat's off to them. Mm. We need people like that. It, 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 it reaffirms my faith in humanity when I see someone that I think is vastly superior or great at what they do. I wish I could be like them. Okay, there are other humans on this world, it's not as bad as we think it is, who are absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I feel that way about great scientists as well. I'm kind of a, a scientist monke in a way. So, um, what's a monke? Oh, sorry. No, I love it. You're teaching uh, me something. Yeah. It's a French word. Monke means a uh, failed, you know, I wanted to be a wannabe. Mm. I'm a scientist wannabe sort of thing. I missed the boat. It literally means missed. Um, so, you know, I deeply admire it. And, um, and if I detect creativity in people in their work, I'm in awe of it. You know, and there are people who can do creativity that I can't even begin to imagine. That's where I feel awe and genuine admiration. I never feel envy. Believe me, I feel envy all the time, but not for people who are incredibly creative. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. That's a great frame. I love that, I, like you, when I meet somebody that blows me away, I love it. Like I'm yeah. stoked. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't want it also for myself, but sure. I'm stoked that it exists in the world. Um, yeah, that is very exciting when you see what humans are capable of. And then when yeah. you take us as a collective and it's really interesting. So I just, I was interviewed by a guy named Brian Keating yesterday who wrote a book about, um, I think it's called into the impossible. Uh, but he talks or no, sorry. His book is about, um, beyond like getting rid of the Nobel prize. I forget the exact title, Brian, forgive me. Um, but he was talking about how the Nobel prize has like caused some of the greatest scientists on planet earth to commit suicide and like all this crazy <laughs> oh, shit. And I was like, what? And he was like, oh yeah, you, you um, get these guys are nominated for a Nobel prize, but because they never win, it becomes so devastating that they can't live with it. And I'm like, you're nominated for a Nobel prize, something <laughs> that like 0.00001% of humanity will ever you yeah. know, achieve. Uh, yeah. But he was like, yeah, is like a really a devastating thing for people. And he, he of course, re remembered all the people that had won. And I guess you have to sign this book when you win. And so in the book, you see like um, 
Albert Einstein and all these other people. And he said, you know, Feynman was like, well, I'm never going to be an Einstein. Einstein was like, I'm never going to be a Newton. Newton was like, I'm never going to be a Galileo or whatever. Right, and right. it was like, you know, that all of these people were just like, we look at them and like, oh my God, like that would be insane to hit that level. And each and every one of them had someone that they were like, well, but I'll never be that person. So fascinating. Well, that's 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 human nature in a nutshell, because I talk about that in, in the laws of human nature in the chapter about envy, that our brains operate by comparison. Mm. That's how it operates on the most basic level. To a piece of information comes through our senses and our brain immediately processes it by comparing it to previous things that we that we've experienced. So the brain only operates by comparing. So when you create a social animal that has a brain that operates that way and is conscious, obviously they're going to be primed to continually compare themselves to other people, right? So Albert Einstein was comparing himself to Niels Bohr, to other people who he had insecurities as well, people who were into quantum mechanics and making these great discoveries. He felt that kind of little wound of envy as well, and it's been written about. So yeah, it's impossible to get over. The most powerful person in the world is going to feel that envy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the higher up you go, the more insecure you might tend to become. You know, and you wonder, do I still have it? I'm getting older. A lot of scientists reach their prime when they're 30, 35. Now they're 45 and they're 50 and that Nobel Prize slipped through their hands, even though they're absolutely brilliant. So they're going to be feeling envy. Envy is deeply, deeply human and nobody wants to talk about it. It's the most common human emotion and it's the least common uh, topic that we ever discuss. Mm. Except in your books where you Except go into in it books. beautifully, <laughs> which I love. And yeah. that's part of the fun of your books is yeah. it's all the things that nobody wants to talk about yeah. and talked about well and articulately with stories and evidence. I mean, it's really fascinating. And for anybody that wants to you know, do what we were talking about earlier and develop that self-awareness, just hearing about it talked about so clearly is very helpful. Oh, well, thank you. Very helpful. Dude, I love your work. I, yeah. It has been a joy to have you on the show oh, as yeah. many times as I have. I cannot wait for the next one. Yeah, this um, is what, my fourth time? You, three or four, yeah. One, and hopefully there two, will be three, five, six. That's incredible. <laughs> All right, my friend, I have a big announcement. My incredible and talented wife, Lisa, is about to launch her new book, Radical Confidence. In it, she has managed to perfectly capture the process of how to go from feeling lost and insecure to taking control of your life and doing amazing things despite feeling fear, sometimes a lot of fear. Now, let me tell you, nobody knows Lisa better than me, but when I read Radical Confidence for the first time and heard her describe what it was like for her to go from having these big Big, exciting dreams as a kid to then as an adult scheduling her life around the TV shows that she wanted to watch or how lonely and isolated she felt instead of pursuing her dreams it was brutal for me I would never say though that it was worth it for her to go through all of that just so that she could write something down that allows others to avoid it but I will say that at least she was able to capture the strategies that she used to break out of that rut find her voice and begin doing incredible things despite her insecurity and fears that she wasn't going to be good enough to achieve great things. So while it hurts me to know the dark place that Lisa went through, I really am excited for people who are going through something similar right now to read this book. Radical Confidence is an instruction manual for how to become the hero of your own life even when you're scared to death. Look, I know better than just about anybody how easy it is to get off track in life or to just not have yet found your calling. And it's even easier for people to feel so insecure and unprepared that they don't even want to pursue the things that they want. But what Lisa shows people in radical confidence is that the radical part is that you can accomplish extraordinary things even when you feel fear. That's what radical confidence is being afraid and unsure and having a toolkit that allows you to still make massive progress. Pre-order your copy today because if you act now, you can claim the bonuses that Lisa has created for you at RadicalConfidence.com. They're only available if you pre-order, so act now. Then, once you've done that, we'll get back to today's episode. All right, guys, read the book and get ready to be the hero of your own life. Peace out. When I think about for something to, to be 
for you to say that it's better to, you know, to really self-analyze, it makes me think you have a goal. What, what is your goal maybe for your life that might be the right place to start? Like what to you is, is a life well lived in the context of you judging, doing the self-reflection and understanding how the way the world works becomes this exceedingly fun thing for you? Well, I mean, you're asking really good questions and I'm glad you're pressing me on that. I, I like that. Um, but it comes down to what you want with for yourself, right? So are you somebody that's interested in actually having power in this world? Are you someone that's interested in being successful in your venture? In real Define power for me. Most people think it's a dirty word. You've sort of made your your life around that realm. Uh, you think power is realm. a dirty word, you've got a problem. And usually the people who think I'm power is a dirty word are the people who are the most manipulative and passive aggressive animals on this planet. Because that's interesting. we humans naturally want power. We want a degree of control over our, our lives. So imagine the scenario where you can't control anything about your children. They just run wild. You can't influence them. You can't control any of the behavior of your spouse that's irritating the fuck out of you. You can't control your colleagues who are plotting all these things. You have no, and your boss is making you crazy. You have no control. That's a recipe for incredible, not only misery, but depression for turning into all kinds of health problems, for turning to drugs and alcohol, for going off the deep end by the time you're 40, right? So you want power in your life. Power is, I have goals, I have a fate, I have a destiny in life. I want by the time I'm 40 to reach them. The ability to reach that, to have control over yourself and, your, and to a degree of your emotions, not repressing them, but some control, right? will help you realize those goals. That is power. Power isn't like some politician up there kind of weaving all these Machiavellian things to hurt and destroy people. That's the cliche. You've been watching House of Cards for too long. I know nobody watches that anymore, but whatever the new show is. So that's not power. Power is the ability to guide yourself in a, through a very dangerous world, very competitive world where every, we're almost all having to kind of work for our, ourselves where we don't get much help or cooperation from the world we're thrown out of the university if we go to college and here we're in this world where there are no rule books telling us how to navigate it it's very complicated and very difficult and you make mistakes that you can suffer for and power is knowledge is ideas is understanding how to navigate a very dangerous world okay so you want that to get back on track to what i was saying so you want that, right? You want to be, and this is something that I talk about in mastery, the idea of wasting your potential, of never realizing your goals, of never being able to, to, to create that business you wanted to create or make that film that you think is in you or start the business that you're starting, Tom. You know, that's what you want in life. And if you don't want that, there's nothing I can say that'll help you, right? I'm starting with the assumption that you want that, and I think most people do want that, okay? So your, your rage, you're, you're constantly being wasting time on the internet, you're constantly being effect, infected by the emotions of other people, is wiping away day by day, second by second, all of your own power, right? Because what is your power? Your power, as you, Tom, is to be able to realize what makes you different, what makes you unique. You had... I don't quite remember the full trajectory of your career, but I remember you early on with the health company that you had started and all this. And then you had a plan. Your plan is to create this kind of empire. I'm not trying to reveal your secrets here, but you have. I'll reveal away. Okay, you have this idea of creating a new kind of empire, sort of a new Disney, right? And that comes from something within, I'm assuming, that there's something of the child in you that wants that, that you've wanted that for a while, that it, it represents something that's unique about you. It's not something that comes from social media or the people around you. That could play a small role, but it's mostly something from within you. It's you, okay? And that's you. What makes you different and unique is your source of power. And the days you spend getting angry about things that aren't have nothing to do with your day-to-day -day life, they're, where, they're corroding that uniqueness of you, and they're making you a conforming Pavlovian dog that's just like everybody else out there in the world. If you look at the people who are truly successful and powerful, see them as kind of models or icons to reach, okay? 
It's not to say that we all have to be incredibly successful to feel fulfilled. I'm not saying that. I know people who are, who are really great carpenters who are great at that, and that's really fulfilling. And I know people who, uh, who just want to be parents, and that's their life's task, and it's tremendously fulfilling. But the people who are really successful, even at those things, we can say that they're, that they're unique, that they're one of a kind, that there's nobody else like them. And that is the source of your power, right? So you want that. If you don't want that, I can't help you. But if you do want that, you're, the time you're wasting getting enraged and being manipulated and feeling all these things and just getting into that lizard part of you is time you're wasting. And, and your life is, is a lot shorter than you think it is. Ooh, uh, ending on a on a big one there. Um, uh, before we get to mortality, death, all that, which I think is incredibly powerful, um, I want to talk about that the idea of Carl Jung and the shadow side. So, no, I don't think there's anybody writing today that speaks as eloquently as you do about the shadow, about the sort of dark energy that we all have inside of us that can be extraordinarily powerful, and. I know you well enough to know your beliefs around this are nuanced, but listening to you as you were talking there, it's like, you know, don't get sucked into rage. You're going to be wasting your life. Life is shorter than you think. Um, that is true. But there's also an element of capture that rage, my friend, leverage that rage, point it at something that makes sense. And this is where it gets incredibly complicated because if you have a goal and there's something that you want to go after, um, letting something piss you off can actually be quite powerful. And I talked to my students in Impact Theory University about this idea of having an animus, having something that that literally animates you, that you you can't live in a world where that thing is true and holding on to your anger enough to to turn it into something usable. So you're not just flailing around, reacting, freaking out, but it's like, hey, I'm not, this is not okay. I'm going to fan the flames of that, I'm not going to let them burn me to death, but I'm going to fan the flames of that, get angry and go do something about it. So how do you think about that? As you point out very aptly that the, the anger can cause you to waste your life, but also it's a tool. How, how do you help people reconcile that idea? Well, these are all great. <clears throat> Another great question. Um, well, you know, I'm thinking back on, on, on myself and the anger that propelled me to where I am today, which was largely my experiences in Hollywood. And um, just to tell that story very briefly, I worked in Hollywood from like the very late 80s into the mid 90s. And I saw a lot of very, very manipulative people. Um, and a lot of hypocrisy, where it was supposedly all about creating great art or making a film, but really it was about power. It was about using people and getting what you wanted out of it, getting more power than the other person and getting recognition. And that was the true subtext of what everybody motivated most people in Hollywood. And man, that pissed me off. The hypocrisy of that pissed me off. Okay. Now, is that something that comes from, is that just sort of a, a superficial reaction to me feeling like, because I wasn't successful, was I just simply hurt? Was it more like envy because I wasn't very successful myself in Hollywood, to be honest? Or did it come from something deeper? And in analyzing it, yes, it came from something very deep. Since I was a child, I've always been very, very sensitive to people's hypocrisy, to people pretending to be something that they're not. And I think a lot of children are like that. They're very, they have antennae for that. And it really angered me. And then you could ask yourself, well, why... Why does that anger you? Because I feel like, you know, it's like people pretending to be something that they're not, you know. And you just have an inherent value no, that that's a no, bad it's not, thing? It's not just an inherent value. It's just that we're all flawed creatures. And I must have been aware since I was a child that I am a flawed individual. Robert, I have dark emotions. I can be kind of bitter and aggressive and ambitious and hurtful, right? I knew from very early on of my own flaws. And it really irritated me that people pretended to be something else, you know, that they weren't, you know, they weren't true to themselves. And you could, see, I could see that in children who were pretending to be 
the little princess or the prince and their family, like they were perfect, that they were really good. And then I would see the other side when we, you know, for mommy and daddy, they were all perfect. But then when we played, I could see the, the little nasty little rascal come out, right? I hated that. You know, okay, we could go, we could dig deeper and deeper. Well, why did I hate that? But I think it came from something very real about who, something about me. So my irritate, my anger at Hollywood wasn't really, I, I don't deny that there was an element of, of, you know, I didn't get success. So I feel kind of envious because we all feel that. But I don't think that was the full picture. There was something very real about it. And because I've been feeling it throughout when I was a kid, it was feeling it throughout my 20s. It was the subject of all the short stories, novels and plays and screenplays I was trying to write. So it came from a very deep, real place. So when it came time to write my first book, The 48 Laws of Power, beginning in 1996, I had to draw on that anger, you know. And if it had been something that wasn't really me, if it was something that, like, was just a gimmick, I don't think it would have worked. So if your emotions don't come from something that's very profound about who you are, about that dark side, isn't something that you are, but it's like a gimmick, you're just pretending to be angry, and there are a lot of people who do that, or you're pretending to have some other kind of emotion. We humans, we can smell that. We can sniff out phoniness fairly well. But I felt it very deeply, and I disguised it in the 48 Laws. I channeled it into a book where you never really knew that it was from Hollywood. In my, I never talked about myself, but you could feel the subtext of some kind of a little bit of anger there, people's hypocrisy, right? So I took some an emotion that was part of who I am, right? And I used it in very constructive, channeled, productive way, which is what I say about the, the dark side. So, you know, to get back to the, to the theory behind it, you know, when you were a child, you were what I call like you were like a round ball, a ball that had a front side and a dark side that's not visible, like the dark side of the moon, right? The front side was you're saintly, you're sweet, you're nice and loving to your parents. You treat your sister and your brother so well. You get along with all your friends. But the dark side was, wow, man, I really hate that kid. I'm going to pull her hair. I'm going to mess his homework. I'm going to you know, do this. All the things that kids naturally do because we have an animal nature. We have aggressive impulses. This includes boys and girls. I'm not certain girls can be just as, as part of this as, as boys are. Okay, and then as you get older, that you you like cut your head, that ball in half, and you only present that only. It's not only that you just present the good side; it's that you kind of forget about that other half, and it drops away from you, and you just pretend to be this good person because you're socially motivated to make people think that you're a nice, pleasant, socially aware person, and then that all that dark energy gets repressed and repressed and repressed. But nothing ever goes away. That's the law of human psychology. Things you felt when you were three or four or five, they don't go away. They just sit in you. And they either sit in you and stew and then explode when you're 30 into some irrational behavior. Or you're aware of it. You're aware that I feel this way. You're aware that I feel envy. You're aware that you feel aggression and anger. You're aware that you sometimes actually want to hurt people. Okay? You're aware that, that you're a full human being and you're not a fucking hypocrite like so many people are out there. I have a dark side. It's part of who I am. All right. But don't you try to keep that in check? I mean, it's not like what's your prescription on that? Is it like what does it mean to integrate the shadow? It means uh, we keep coming back to this. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm so boring here because I keep repeating the same idea. It means you're aware of it. Right. But being aware that I'm angry or that I have bitterness or whatever, like, isn't it really the because what I'm trying to figure out is uh, you and I react very differently to the sort of bullshit of Hollywood's a great example, because now I as you have exited, I am now trying to enter. And because I am so hyper aware of how people talk about Hollywood. I came in and said, look, I'm just going to make my reputation on I'm always going to tell you where I'm at. So when I see somebody being fake, full of shit, whatever, because I'm attuned enough to see it for the most part, I'm sure people pull some things over on me. 
But for the most part, I feel like I can sniff it out like you were saying before. But I have like almost a sadness that that's the only tool that they've learned to leverage. And so I don't get the sort of anger towards people that are manipulative or whatever. Go ahead. That's fine. What's, what's your point? So where I'm going is where how do you get to the point where now you're not just being aware of it, but you're using it. So it's how how can somebody who's listening to this go, I am going to take my so you gave us the example of how you channeled it into your book. But now just like in terms of daily life, I'm guessing when you see somebody being fake, you don't rage out on them. So you are restraining. Sure. Them. So in in when I talk about integration, is it the awareness leads to just being able to hold it back? Or is there like I will use it if somebody's bullshitting me and they're trying to be aggressive to me, then I just be aggressive back. And so there's an element I've, I feel like I can control it. Aggression, anger are tools in my tool belt and I pull them out when I think they're appropriate. Yeah. Well, that's good. But, you know, you're are, are you conscious? Are you aware that you're doing that or are you just simply reacting to people? Are you able to? I in a, in a, that's certainly been an evolution. To, so there are, are you able to use it in a somewhat strategic way? So, for instance, there's somebody you come up across in Hollywood who is a manipulator and you can smell it. But you go if you like simply call them out on it, you might create some problems for yourself. You might create a, a counter reaction that will work against you. Are you able to step back and go, hmm, I need to be strategic with this asshole. I need to not just simply react. I need to say something that will either show him or her that this is what they're being like, or I need to take some kind of action that will thwart them. Are you able to do that? Or are you just simply getting angry in response? It's, uh, I'm very strategic, but at the same time, I want, I want to feel good about who I am as I walk away from that exchange. So I don't want to feel like I'm just bullshitting people either. Um, so normally I, I put it into asking questions about like, what's your goal? Or I'll even say like, it feels like you're angry with me or upset with me and I don't understand why. Yeah. Um, you know, and if you can help me understand, I'm certainly not trying to piss you off. Um, and it has like, I won't say it. I, I haven't been in it long enough to know what the long-term repercussions of my strategy are going to be. Um, it's created awkward moments. It has certainly ended potential relationships. Um, but I am, I'm constantly trying to think about who I want to be in the exchange when I walk away and what I want my long-term reputation to be. And that means having the uncomfortable conversation up front so that what I say to you doesn't end up being different than how I actually move, if that makes sense. But how is that your dark side? Well, so what I'm trying to figure out in terms of the what what you mean by integrating. So I'm guessing it. Hey, here's what I do, which is uh, if somebody's being aggressive towards me and it seems like the right answer, then I will like let off like that little valve of instead of repressing everything, I will let a little bit come out. But I don't know. The only way that I leverage my shadow is as energy when I'm alone. So I don't know that I'm integrating it in an intelligent way in these exchanges. And, and I think that's part of what I'm looking for is feedback on if there's a way that I haven't got. So here's how I present it to people that ask me. And I say 80% of your time should be in the light, should be in the beautiful things, the wonderful things you want to create, optimism, hope, uh, compassion. 20% of the time, you're going to lean on, I call it the dark energy, the shadow side, where it is, I, for instance, when I am fucking exhausted to my core and I just do not have energy to keep going, in those moments, I think about the people that want me to fail. And I'm like, fuck them. Yeah. I am not going to let them be right. I am not going to let them see me fail. It is a dark, ugly, petty energy and it's fucking intoxicating and it gets me up and it gets me going and it keeps me pushing. You're answering your question right there. You're answering my question. There's your integration right there. You're taking an emotion that could be destructive if you acted on it in the wrong way and you're using it as a way to motivate yourself. You, you're not, you're not spewing this at people. You're making it sort of sharpen your own ambition, your own goals, and go, I better get up in the morning and prove this idiot that they're wrong about me. You're not hurting them, but you're channeling it into something productive. So you just answered your question. That's very much integrating it. It's whether your dark side is used 
for destructive purposes. I'm not advocating that you hurt people. I didn't go out and ever name a single name of anybody in Hollywood who ever did. You could read my book. You'll never know that that's what it was about, right? I didn't want to hurt people. I don't like you. I don't like hurting people. It makes me feel ugly. And that ugly feeling ends up costing me more than any kind of benefit I might have gotten from venting it, right? I don't want that. But So you're not actually trying to hurt people. You're using it to make yourself more productive. So, for instance... You know, you have a business, you have ambitions, you have goals, and you use all the people who doubt you, like you're doing, and you're going to make that a motivating device. That's very powerful. Let's say you're an artist, and you've had a lot of, your parents were really nasty to you, they were very abusive, and you carry that around with you, and it's like this 500-pound rock on your, your whole life, it's just pressing you down. And now in your, in your play, or your book, or your movie, you let it out. And you, you, you don't say this is who they are, but you express it indirectly about very manipulative people and you show your kind of anger in a work of art. And some of the greatest works of art have an underpinning of some kind of motivating anger that's productive. Let's say there's something that really pisses you off in the world, some form of injustice, whether it's sexism, racism, whatever it is. Instead of like just getting on Facebook and posting all kinds of stupid little things and not getting anywhere, you go out and you decide, I'm going to start a movement. I'm going to create some kind of social movement that's going to actually get something done. I'm actually going to contribute to society instead of just venting and spewing my own personal pet peeves. You're taking that dark energy and you're channeling it into something productive. That's the integration. You're not using it to hurt people. You're using it to motivate you to create something. And the other thing is, we live in a culture that is so politically correct, where people are so worried about, if I use this pronoun, am I going to offend that person? If I say this, am I going to lose my career? We're all so repressed that to see somebody who ex expresses some of that, of that repressed emotion in their work, particularly in a work of art, it's like, wow, that's great. It, it's an attraction. It's a form of charisma that we'll have because you're less repressed than other people. So I'm trying to tell people that dark side contains incredible creative energy, incredible motivating power, like you said, when you get up in the morning. And use it. Don't be afraid of it, but use it. Does that kind of answer what, what you're asking? Help us understand what the world is really like. What, what do you think is that key thing that people misunderstand? Well, the key thing is it goes back to our nature and how we evolved as, as conscious animals. The key thing is there's an animal part of our nature, which is we completely take appearances for reality. That's sort of the source of our problems and our misery, to be honest with you, in life. So the front that people present, the way they look, the way they talk to us, their words, we sort of take at face value. And although we might think or we might know from reading a book or whatever that you can't always trust appearances is kind of a cliche, we can't control ourselves. So it makes us extremely vulnerable to charming people, to charlatans, to con artists, to politicians who say one thing, who do another, to relationships, terrible relationships where we fall in love with exactly the wrong person, to the worst kind of hires. You know, I do a lot of consulting work. I've been doing it for over 20 years now. The number one problem I deal with is I hired the worst person in the world and they're making my life hell, right? And why did you hire the wrong person? Because you judge them on their charming smiles, their appearance, their, their smooth talk, their resume, which you can conceal a lot with your resume. You didn't look behind the facade and look at what's underneath the character. So this is kind of ingrained in our nature. It goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's extremely difficult to overcome, right? And I have the problem too. I deal with it all the time. And, and I have to go through a process where I, I step back and I say, I don't want to be paranoid, but this person is so nice and pleasant. Is there something else going on behind, behind the curtain that, that's there? You know, and then sometimes I tell myself, no, I have ways of judging that they're, that they're, there's a consistency between the face and the reality, but oftentimes there is not. And I've become very good at that kind of bullshit detect detection, which I've been doing my whole life. How do you get good at that? Well, 
You know, some things are hard to put into words, which is why I struggle so diff much with my books. Um, because a lot of human communication, I estimated 95%, it's just a number, is nonverbal, mm. right? So we don't pay much attention to that because we're so word-oriented, right? We're so embedded in language that we think everything in terms of what people say. But unconsciously, without even realizing it, we're continually judging people on their nonverbal behavior, right? So there's their eyes, their smile are, are different from what they actually say, but we're not really... So in a kind of a, pre, a natural, intuitive way, we understand that, but we don't trust those kind of judgments, right? So we, we rely more on what they say than on what the signals that we pick up from their body language. So years and years of training and being sensitive to it, it's probably something that has to go back to my childhood. If you put me on a couch and psychoanalyze <laughs> me right here, there was probably something in my childhood where I had to learn how to really read people, not by what they said, by but everything about them. And I have a kind of a feel, an intuitive feel for the energy, the vibrations, the mood that people give off, not through what they say, but through their body, through particularly their tone of voice and all the other signals. That is a number, that is the main way of judging, you know, what's going, what's really going on. The other thing you look at are people's patterns of behavior, right? Things that have happened in the past. As I said in, in Laws of Human Nature, nobody ever does one something just once, right? If somebody fucks up and does something kind of hurts you in some way, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what came over me, that, that's not me. Don't trust that. It'll happen again. <laughs> For sure, it will happen again a second, a third, fourth time. What do you think is going on there? Because when you were going through the list of things, being in a bad relationship was the one that really jumped out of, you know, you hear people ending in these just like horrendous cycles of being stuck in this abusive relationship and the person manages to reel them back in. What is going on on the side of the person who convinces themselves to go back into that relationship? Is there the need to be loved? Is there a wound or something that you're that they're trying to deal with? And how do you advise people that are stuck in a loop like that? Well, it's probably from some kind of primal wound, right? So there's a perverse part of human nature, which is oftentimes in early childhood, something happened to us, often something that didn't happen to us, mm -hmm. like the love we didn't get, or the feel the, the nurturing that we didn't get. There's this kind of wound, this emptiness, this lack, right? And we grow up and we're not really aware of it and kind of things grow over this wound. But what also happens, which is the perverse side of human nature, is that early on, our kind of sexual excitement is sort of kind of grows up around that wound. Why? So, that is so weird and yet seems so self-evidently true. Yeah. But <laughs> why? Well, I, I'd have to be like, I'd have to go into something, you know, hit my, go inside my own psychoanalytic, uh, w you know, mindset here. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're very young, you're extremely vulnerable. You're extremely open to the energies of other people in ways we don't understand right now, right? It's, it's, it's hard to imagine something what I'm writing about right now in my new book. When you're two years old, one years old, before you even had really mastered language, you're so dependent on other people, you're so open to them, that their energy gets infused, it's inter completely internalized. And also, children at, at that age also have, their, their sort of sexual nature is being created at that moment, at a very, very early age, certain desires. You know, for us, sex is not just a physical thing, it's an emotional thing, right? We have, it's, it's psychological. So things that we didn't get are charged with all of this kind of energy that then could later on turn into sort of desires. So let's say, for instance, you had a mother um, who was very narcissistic, who really wasn't giving you the normal mother, nurturing, empathetic energy. It was more about her and you had to pay attention to her, right? Well, that kind of creates the sort of desire you're, you're as an infant, you really want that love from that mother. 
You're trying to drag, you're trying to attract and pull it out of her as best you can. And your energy, your desire is, is surrounding her with this kind of emotional charge, sexual energy. And you're going to find throughout your life, you are going to be attracted to narcissistic women. It's going to be your, your Achilles heel throughout your life because you want to kind of re heal that wound. You want to be able to play back that initial trauma and sort of rewrite the way it ended up where now you're going to find this narcissistic woman and she's going to give you finally what you never had before. But it's a very, very common pattern, right? And so you're not even aware of this. And it's extremely difficult to break out of because your desire is for this type of person. So you might meet a woman, just doing it from a man's point of view, who isn't narcissistic, who's very empathetic and very caring. And she would be perfect for you. And you may even have a relationship with her. But the excitement, the energy, that charge isn't going to be as strong as with that other type. And you're going to fall back into the old patterns again and again and again. And the only way out of it is to go back and look at your early childhood and look at these wounds and confront them face to face and understand that you're a prisoner of this kind of of this kind of things that were ingrained in you at a very very early age. And what does that process look like? Like how do you confront something like that well? How do you even develop the awareness of the problem? Well, you have to look at what's going on in the present right now. You have to be, first of all, it depends on how old you are and how many relationships you have, but you have to see your own patterns. And if you have unhealthy patterns where you have debt fallen again and again and again for the wrong person, you have to see a, a sort of a through line there. What ties it all together? What's going on, right? So, um, you know, a common scenario that I wrote about in human nature is in this particular scenario where your mother is giving you the attention that you think you want, right? You have this feeling when you're a child three or four years old that that mother is abandoning you. That it's almost your fault in that case, right? Because you don't want to believe that a parent could be wrong or flawed because it's too painful a thought. So you want to think that you are flawed and she has abandoned you for some reason. It's very painful. So what you're going to do throughout your life is you're always going to be the one cutting off a relationship before it gets too intense so that you don't ever have to go through that abandonment feeling again, right? That's your pattern, right? So after six months, the relationship is kind of, you know, growing. You'll find some excuse. She's not right for me. She's saying the wrong things. She's da 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 You'll break off the relationship blaming her when in fact, you're afraid, deeply afraid that she's going to abandon you and you can't stand that. So you've got to see these patterns and they're very painful and they're very difficult because they're touching upon things that go to the heart of who we are. You know, it's not just in your relationships. You're going to probably be doing that with your jobs as well. You're going to be quitting jobs before they, you know, before you get to the point where you have too much responsibility. They're very, very deeply ingrained in you and you have to be able to look at them so awareness is everything. The ability to look at yourself realistically and understand you're saying, see things as they are, see the world as it is. It begins with yourself, seeing yourself as you are, right? And seeing that your adult self that's so confident and, and has this, you know, this way about the world is covering over some wounds, some vulnerabilities from your deep childhood. Not everybody, but for a lot of people, that's the case. Mm. You have to be willing to, to rip away the skin and look underneath and see that wound and touch upon it and then kind of analyze it and sort of see the patterns in your life before you can begin to. One thing that you do really well, which I think is definitely part of your appeal, is that you're able to write about these difficult things in human nature without needing to remove yourself. So you're not doing it as a spectator. Oh, oh, those humans over there, <laughs> they've got problems. Um, you're able to really look at it yourself. So as you think about this process of ripping the skin away, I think was the, the phrase that you said, um, and confronting that, how do you begin to, to translate what's actually happening without the need for the ego to step in and say, no, 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 you're, 
it, to not go in either direction, quite frankly, to either then say, oh, because you have this flaw, you are a loser or to blind yourself to the flaw and say, no, 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 that's it's not a problem. Like, how do people find that middle ground of acknowledging it without succumbing to negative emotion around it? That's a great question. Um, you know, so sometimes, you know, you need help in these areas, depending on the depth of the wound. So sometimes you need a third person's eyes on it. You can't necessarily analyze it yourself, which is why you might want to go into therapy or you might want a spouse or significant other or someone you love and trust who can tell you these things. Because sometimes it's very hard for you to have any kind of distance from them, you know. But um, the, the, the ability to detach yourself from uh, your own emotions is extremely important in life. It doesn't mean that you become a cold, rational person at all. I don't believe in that at all. Emotions are extremely important for us. It's what makes us creative. It what feeds our imagination, gives us drive. But the ability that you can gain over your life in this instant and in every other instant to have a degree of a detachment, not a, it's only a matter of degree, where you can stand back and you feel something very powerfully. You feel attracted to something or a person. You feel excited or repulsed. And to not react and to step back and analyze and go, why am I feeling this right now? Is it because of what somebody is saying right now? Or does it go deeper to that? Is it related to some other issue? That is a skill that is not easy, but you can develop it day by day by day, taking little steps. And so if you're able to slowly detach yourself from your day-to-day -day emotional reactions, it gives you a little bit of distance between you and your ego, right? So I meditate every morning. I've been doing it now for 11 years, for Smart. like 40, over 40 minutes. It's a, a ritual that if I don't do, I feel extremely depressed, something's mm -hmm. wrong. Okay, and when I'm meditating, I become deeply aware these thoughts start coming up, they bubble up, you can't control them. You become deeply aware of your ego, of certain patterns in your thinking, of certain anxieties, of certain kind of neurotic thought patterns, right? You're seeing it before your eyes, it's floating there. This is your ego, Robert, it's going here, there, and there, you can see it. And now, when you're in that state, you can almost see it as if it's another person. And it's very powerful, and it's very liberating. Now, in the case of someone who's dealing with a deep wound, I don't know if you can go, you can't go there like tomorrow and do this. I'm a realistic person. I'm very practical. I don't want to advise people something that's not going to happen. It's something that you're going to have to, it's a life skill that you have to build the, 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 the power to, to take, take a step back and look at yourself with some distance and see that ego as if it's over there, it's floating in front of you. It's giving you signs of who you are, you know, you can develop that and it's very powerful and it will give you the ability to look at your own wounds objectively. But you're never going to reach a, a, a degree of 100% detachment. Me, who has been practicing this for many years, I still get caught up in those wounds. I still get caught up in my ego. It's just a matter of degree. That, that's all I'm talking about. Mm. This is such an insanely complicated issue when I think about, okay, so if the number one problem is people aren't aware that there's a game being played, basically, you can't take things sort of at their surface. And then understanding that, as you were saying, that self-awareness is also this critical part. Then there are the studies that have shown that your mind will give you a reason for something, even when that reason is obviously not true. And I don't know if you heard about that study where people that have had the ability to form uh, long-term memories damage, so they can do short-term memories, but you could reintroduce yourself to them every three minutes and they'd be like, oh my God, they'd greet you anew each time. And the doctor put a pin in his hand and he walked in and he shook hands and it poked the person, they jerked their hand back, like, you know, why'd you do that? They leave, they come back, three minutes later, the person does not remember meeting them at all, they stick out their hand and the person will refuse to shake it. And so they don't remember ever meeting them before. And so they'll say, why won't you shake my hand? Oh, well, you know, I've had a longstanding rule. I don't shake the hand of people with white lab coats. And they come up with all these different excuses because the brain can't like sit there in this ignorance. And so you have something that's clearly hardwired in us to to. So we I have heard humans referred to as meaning making machines 
which makes a lot of sense to me. We make meaning out of something. Right. So if we have this hardwired propensity to come up with some sort of meaning, something somewhere, and we have the psychological immune system, which doesn't want me to feel badly about myself. So now I have an inclination to lie to myself, basically, from some like deep seated part of me that survives even damage to the ability to make long term memories. And so when I think about the deck being stacked against people in terms of really figuring out what's actually going on inside themselves, it gets a little scary. And this is where so for me, when I think about, OK, if all of the things that I just said are true, nested inside of all the stuff you've been talking about. The only path I see out of that is you because everyone needs self-esteem. So your psychological immune system is trying to make you feel good about yourself. Got it. So you need to take conscious control of feeling good about yourself, but you need to wrap it around something anti-fragile so that for the only answer I've come up with in my own life is to be the learner. That way, if I do something stupid, I make a mistake, whatever, I can just go, hey, that sucks and it does make me feel badly, but I only value myself for being a learner. And since recognizing how I actually am would be useful, then I'll face the truth of what this is right. and then I can learn and move on. Well, you touch on an extremely important critical thing here, the element that I'm, I'm trying to hit at, which is your level of desire for change. So if you're trapped in these patterns and you feel a great degree of pain and your life isn't going anywhere and you're having bad relationships, bad work habits, and you say, I can't deal with this anymore. You're extremely motivated to go through the process that you just mentioned, which is after every event that occurs, you go through a kind of an autopsy, right? And you analyze. You can do this on a daily basis with a journal, or you can do it on a weekly basis. You know, what did I do there? What was the element of where I actually might have created the problem between me and another person? And I have to be reasonably rational and I have to be reasonably realistic. You're right. If, if we saw it completely into ourselves, we would hate ourselves so thoroughly that we wouldn't get out of bed. We would all be killing ourselves. You do need a degree of illusion. You do need a degree of self-esteem and confidence, right? And what happens is, you know, it's kind of like an internal thermostat. And so you have like people who are what I call deep narcissists who have no kind of sense, no anchor inside of them, no real sense of self-esteem to hold on to. And when that self-esteem starts going down, 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 they have no way of dealing with it. And their only way of dealing with it is acting out in the way that narcissists act out. So we all have, if we're not a deep narcissist, we have that thermostat where things start hurting us a little bit and we bring ourselves back up through the self-esteem mechanism so we don't get too depressed and too down. And there's an element of unreality to that, but it's very valuable. And I would never, ever, ever want to burst that. You need a degree of illusion in your life. It's very important. But if you really want change, if you're really fed up, if you're not kidding yourself, if you're not going through this bullshit process, yeah, I kind of want to change my life, but you don't really mean it then nothing, you, no words, no, no therapy will ever get you to that point. Mm -hmm. You almost have to hit bottom. You almost have to tell yourself, I can't take this anymore. And now the motivation is so deep that you're able now to go through, to begin the process of going through that kind of self-analysis because it's the only way you're going to get out of it. It's the only way. You know, a lot of, the, of, of our culture is making this worse in a way. Unfortunately, I mean, there's good things in our culture now, but there are bad things. Give me some of the bad. Well, I think social media, for all the good that it does, makes it very hard to be self-reflective. Interesting. I, I thought for sure you were going to say it just leads us to compare ourselves. Why does it make it hard to be self-reflective? Well, it does. Well, comparing yourself is not self-reflective. When you compare yourself, your standard is always what other people are doing, right? They're on these great vacations. He's got a great job. Tom has this amazing house where I'm living in this hovel in Los Feliz, right? That's not looking at myself. That's always having the other person as the standard. It makes us so out in the world in other people, what other people are saying, what other people are doing. It makes us continually think in the social sense and not able to turn inside and look at how who we are, what makes us different. 
We're so attuned to what's cool, to what other people are doing out there, to what other people are saying, that we lose a kind of an intuitive grasp of who we are, right? So the psychologist Abraham Maslow talked of impulse voices. He said that a child of one years old has this impulse voice that says, I like this fruit, I don't like this fruit, I'm gonna throw it away, right? And, the, and then other things, these, these voices inside that make them that individual, this is what they like and what they hate, right? And these are very, very important as you develop later in life. You know, this is what you love, these are the subjects that interest you, these are subjects you're not interested in, these are the people you like, these are the people you don't like. It's who you are in the deepest sense of it. It's your what I call your primal inclinations. It's you at its core. And if you're so attuned to what other people are saying and doing and telling you and thinking, that voice gets drowned out by a million other voices and you're not able to hear yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to take a step back and actually look at yourself and analyze yourself. So I think that in some ways this, this dilemma that we're talking about is getting more and more difficult because to be able to do what you're talking about, you have to be willing to be alone. You have to be willing to close the door in your room, write down and say, this is what's going on. This is what happened. This is what I did. This is what they did. You can't be out there in the world and do this. It's impossible to do that process because mm -hmm. you're going to be sucked into the social dynamic and you won't be able to think about yourself. So I think it's made things a little bit harder for people. When you talk about like magical thinking and a culture of BS, what do you mean? Well, um, you know, we're, we're, we humans are gifted with a, a form of consciousness. As far as we know, it, there's no other animal on this planet that has it. Perhaps on another planet, there's something similar we don't know yet. But it comes with a price. You know, basically, it's the same size brain that was developed through the course of evolution hundreds of thousands of years ago in circumstances that are completely different from where we are now. Right. So evolution is a very slow process. So our brains haven't really changed that much. What has increased is the incredible exponential explosion of our knowledge, particularly in the sciences. And but at the same time, that part of our, con our consciousness, our awareness lays on top of a brain that is very primitive in its nature. I mean, you know, the brain is structured in a kind of a hierarchical manner. And at the very bottom, are those most primitive layers, but it's often in cliched terms called the lizard brain, but it's very real. And then there's a kind of a midbrain that's more, you know, evolutionary, that's more where our emotions come from and kind of a connection between the, the lowest part and the highest part. Anyway, so we have this knowledge, this ability to think of, to stand back from our immediate circumstances and contemplate possibilities oh, I don't have to react like an animal to this thing happening. I can step back and I can think. Perhaps I could do A, B, or C, as opposed to just reacting. And that is incredibly powerful. It's what has made us who we are today. But the problem with it is we don't know how to use our brains because we still are trapped in that very primitive model that we have. And so we feel emotions, and emotions tend to govern so much of our thinking because they're much more powerful than the than the kind of weak little signals that come from the frontal cortex and so we're not aware of how deeply our emotions are infecting our decisions in our day-to-day -day life and the people who know this the best are people in marketing because they have been studying since the 1950s all of the amazing psychological t experiments about how you can kind of manipulate people, how if, you, if you're if you a salesman and you just lightly touch somebody on the arm as a friendly gesture, they're 80% more likely to buy your product, right? If you use their name, all these other little tricks, they've been studying it and they know deeply how much that emotional part of us governs our decisions when we buy things. They call it the affective heuristic. It means that our decisions are largely based on emotions. And the problem that we face is we're not aware of that. That was the whole subject of the laws of human nature. We walk around thinking that we're making decisions rationally, that when we buy a product or that when we choose a partner to get involved with, you know, to marry or whomever, that we're 
basically basing this on certain kind of rational um, you know, protocols, but we're not at all. We're infected very, very deeply with emotions. And so that lack of awareness, that belief that we are rational when we're not rational is very, very dangerous. Because answer me this, Tom, how many people do you know who admit to the fact that they are rash, irrational, that, that a decision they made in life, even one that was a mistake, came from an irrational part of them, that it wasn't something that was thought through, that it wasn't something as strategic. I bet you could count them on one hand, you know? Yeah. And I'm as guilty of that as the next person. It's very much part of our nature to deny the fact that mostly we're governed by emotional responses to the world around us. Yeah, the one of the things that I find the most interesting in psychology are the studies of people that have, you know, one brain defect or another. I think it was V.S. Ramachandran that did the study on um, I forget what the damage was to the guy's brain, but he had no short term memory. So a doctor would come into the room and they did this test and they put a pin. The doctor put a pin in his hand and he shook hands with the guy and it jabbed him. And, you know, the guy jerks back. It's like, what the hell? Doctor leaves, comes back three minutes later goes to shake the guy's hand and the guy won't shake his hand. Now, remember, he has no short term memory. So the doctor says, oh, why won't you shake my hand? And the guy's like, well, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with people in white coats. And, you know, obviously he's doing it because some part of his brain retained the fact that when he shook hands with this guy, that it caused pain. And right. the, the conscious mind, though, is pasting over some rationalization to explain right. away this weird behavior. And the fact that our minds are working so rapidly to deliver these socially acceptable reasons for why we're doing something when in reality that isn't at all why we're doing something, that gets really scary really fast. But the other thing, and I've heard you talk about this before, again, one of the most interesting things I've ever come across, where people's brains get damaged and they no longer have access to their emotions. And so right. now they're frozen out. They, they cannot make a decision because right. when you're trying to, you know, think your way through something, we're relying on a feeling, an embodied feeling of one is better than the other. So right. if it is impossible for us to move forward without emotion and dangerous to be unaware of our emotions, how how do we move forward? Well, it's it's not that complicated. So you bring up a good point. Um, a lot of people have a misconception that rationality is the ability to repress your emotions, to somehow subtract them from your decision making process. And that is exactly the wrong way to approach it, because think of it in your own life. If you uh, meet somebody who turns out to be very toxic, like a toxic narcissist, you're, you're going to get a gut reaction, an emotional response from them, right? This, something's wrong with this person. And then that causes you to start thinking about, hmm, maybe I shouldn't involve myself in a partnership with this person. Maybe I shouldn't get in a relationship. So your emotion will trigger a dangerous response, which was sort of the reason why we have emotions, a fear response. Oh, there's a lion hanging out over there. I better be you know, aware of it that emotion then triggers your kind of awareness. So emotions are essential to the rational process. The problem is you have no distance from your emotions. You're not able to take a step back and analyze. Is this a rational response? Is there really a lion over there? Well, you know, I live in Los Angeles. There's probably not a lion over there. It could be a coyote or something, right? So I'm able to step back and kind of analyze the nature of the threat, the nature of what could be something exciting or not. So that's the dividing line, you know? Some, I'm sorry, that, that'll go away. I was um, like, uh, it sounded like it was coming from my side. I'm like, I've never heard that ring before in my life. I should, I should unplug it. There's gonna be one more ring. Hopefully it's telemarketing. I'm just getting inundated lately with telemarketing. Um, anyway, so the ability to step back and, and analyze your emotions and tell yourself, why am I feeling this way? Why am I angry? Why am I excited? That is the key point. That is what divides people who are truly able to be rational from those who can't be, right? So you have to train yourself. It's not natural to who we are because our nature is to simply react, right? So the ability to stand back and say, no, I better wait. Maybe I should wait a couple of days before I send it. Let's see how I think tomorrow. 
and then tomorrow shows you that it was irrational, that, that your emotion wasn't really proportional to the event. So if your emotional reaction is proportional to the threat or to the opportunity, then, you know, then there's a reason for it. But so often, particularly in this hyper social media environment, where it's kind of like we're all feeling constant rage and anger, a lot of times it's not related to anything real or it's out of proportion to the actual problem or threat. So you, you don't try and repress your emotions. You can't write a book. You can't start a business. You can't make a decision about what you want to do without the richness of emotions. The brain is an organic thing. Everything works together. So people who have had that damage where they can't feel the emotion, that the, that the emotions are blocked and there are brain damage that causes that, it's been shown that they can't make rational decisions because they can't decide they can't feel what is a, what is good or what is bad, what is an opportunity, what is dangerous. So you want your emotions. You need them. You're not trying to repress them. Repressing emotions will lead to other problems. What you want is just that tiny little bit of distance, that ability when you're feeling it to go back and go, hmm, why am I really feeling this? What are the roots of it? That's very powerful ability that you can use that you can develop through practice, just like exercise will develop your muscles. Through being able to think before you react, it will slowly become natural to you. But you have to practice it and you have to be aware of that's the source of your problem. Do you have a, a method for how you practice that? Well, the main thing is to be aware of it because, you know, we're, we're creatures that definitely don't like anything kind of painful. We want our lives to be pleasurable. We've had painful experiences in our life. Generally, in social situations, I maintain that most pain is psychological when it comes from bad social interactions. Okay, so you don't want pain in your life. Obviously, everyone's going to answer that, right? So you don't want to make bad decisions. You don't want to have your emotions dragging you along and causing all kinds of havoc. So if you understand that that's the problem, you're now motivated to then try and tackle it. So I could give you the best techniques in the world, but it won't matter at all if you don't feel that need for it, that, that hunger for the ability to have a slight degree of control over your own actions. I practice meditation every morning. And um, I, I highly advocate it. It's, I think it's been one of the best things I've ever done for myself. I've been doing it now for over 10 years. It's like a ritual. And as you're meditating and you're emptying your mind, suddenly emotions and things will start welling up. You don't even know from where, like anger and all this kind of pissy stuff and things about your parents and about all your bad relationships, etc. And now you're thinking, why am I thinking about that now? The sun is shining. I'm trying to empty my mind. Why is this garbage welling up in me? And you start to have some distance and you start to see. I try and picture it like my thoughts and my emotions, they're out there. They're like two feet away from me. They're not inside my head. They're over there. And I could watch my mind creating this little theater of all these little problems and dramas. And that's a beautiful thing. I catch myself now. Because I'm not perfect, I'm very human, and I have the same problems that I'm talking about. But I catch myself, maybe 50% of the time now, wow, you're reacting here. That emotional idiot part of you, that lizard part of you is taking over, and I can step back. So meditation is a very powerful tool. Uh, Ryan Holiday, you know, my good friend, friend of yours, he has very much advocated the use of journaling, of writing things down, and I do that as well. So you can analyze yourself. But the main thing is you've got to train yourself. So in the course of a day, what I tell people is, let's say tomorrow, something triggers an emotional response. And it happens every single day in our lives, right? Something somebody says, something somebody you read in the newspaper or online triggers it. Okay, practice this one thing. Just I ask you one thing tomorrow. Try and do this one little step and go back and go, okay, what am I feeling right now? I'm feeling anger, all right? Okay, first, that's the first step. What am I actually feeling, all right? What is the cause of this anger? 
all right, this person is saying something that really, really annoys me, that really gets my gets my go, et cetera. Okay, why, what are the roots of that anger? Is it something that I personally experienced? Does it go back to my childhood? Or is this just something that's in the media sphere that's kind of, uh, that I'm catching, it's contagious from what other people are getting angry about? Just try and do that one thing tomorrow where you something happens and you step back and you go through that process. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? What are the roots of it? And is it something that's real or isn't real? And then if you just do that once, you'll, it'll be very interesting because you never do it. And then maybe you'll be inspired to try it a second and a third time. That's sort of kind of the process that you can go through. There's a one-two combo, as I'm hearing you explain that, that um... – I worry about, so one, I don't know, as you were walking through that and you were differentiating between, is this something from my past or is this something in the media sphere? And I thought, oh dear God, like do most people actually have that layer of nuance uh, in, in terms of being able to understand themselves? And then also, who, when I think about how easily we, like I will put myself in this, but how easy all of us humans are swayed by the media by other people. Like if somebody knows more about a topic than us, it is all too easy to just be like, Oh, that, that must be true because we don't know enough about it to question it. And when, when we first started talking and you said, you know, there's this one exponential thing that we're not used to. And I thought for sure you were going to say the rate at which information comes at us, because that's the thing that's really freaking me out is information is coming at us so quickly. It is very hard to have the level of um, self-understanding that you're talking about, where even if you're willing to do the work to turn inward and ask the questions, will you be able to understand, discern all of the different things that could be influencing you, which I want to talk about childhood at some point. I've heard you talk about that before. We'll, We'll stay focused here for now. But like the number of things that could be influencing you that you may be totally blind to. And then on top of that, you've got just so much data coming at you so fast, it feels hopeless to keep up with it all. Yeah. Well, um, you have to, you know, one thing that happens to me that in my meditation that's very interesting is I realize how deeply I have been conditioned and that how deeply we've all been conditioned. By what? By other people, by what we hear, by what we read, by the people who talk to us, by our environment, by the culture that we're in, by the times that we're living. The separation from being conditioned is what is truly my own thoughts, what comes from within me. Now, it's a very artificial dividing line because really none of my thoughts totally come from me. I've inherited language that goes back thousands of years. I was conditioned by my parents to respond a certain way, right? And, you know, I've obviously, a lot of my ideas come from books that I've read. So not all of it, the, the dividing line between what's truly me and what's not is is fluid but there is something that you can say is me it's like this is how i think this is what my needs are this is where i am right now in december 2020 this is my reality right okay it's who you are it's what your needs are and what your experience is and then there's that artificial element of all the stuff that you mentioned that's so blasting in our faces from our culture at like you know, light your speed, incredible speeds that are just filling our brains with junk, with information that we don't need, with heated opinions that really aren't our own opinions, right? So you have to be able, first of all, to be able to turn that shit off. I'm sorry to use that language here. Hey, Hey, go for it. (laughs) You've got to be able to turn it off, you know? If you can't, you know, take breaks from social media, from your Instagram account, from Facebook, from Twitter, then you're a prisoner of it. You know, just just admit it to yourself. I am a prisoner of social media. I can't control it. It controls me. And they, we talked earlier about marketing, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook. These people are masters at marketing. They know exactly how to put, press all of your buttons. They know that if they give an, a topic that's very controversial, that's maybe not necessarily true, but is very heated, they'll get more views, more likes, more posts, more reposting, etc. They know how to use certain colors to grab your eye, to grab your attention. They know sounds, little beeping noises on your f- stupid smartphone, 
I like that word, your stupid smartphone, that are going to like engage you and go, whoa, wow, I better pay attention. They are manipulating you. You are conditioned. You are a prisoner of social media. You are not in control of it. You're not, you think you're the one that's posting all these things that you want to post about your life, but really you're not. You're responding to what everybody else is doing. You're being a conformist. If you really want to control it, you would have some distance and you would know, all right, here's something that's really affecting me as an individual that's part of my life that I'm excited about. I want to share that with people. And it comes from, instead of the need to get attention, instead of the need to get people to like you, instead of the need to just vent your rage, it's something that, like, I want to express a reality that I've discovered, an idea. How many times is social media used for the spreading of an actual idea that has been rationally thought out? Well, then that, if you're able to do that, then you are the one in control of this monster, this beast, and you can, be, you can use it for your own purposes. But just think about, and I'm not getting on a high horse here. I am as much guilty of this as anybody. I know how powerful it can be. I know how, when I meditate, I go, whoa, where's that idea coming from? Robert, you have been conditioned. You've been brainwashed by the media around you. So I'm just as guilty as anyone. It's very difficult. You're submerged in it. We're social animals. We're creatures of our culture, of our times. It's not easy. But you have to be able to realize, the first step is to realize that you are someone who's been conditioned just as deeply as one of Pavlov's dogs in those experiments, right? Hello, my friend. You know that I believe success requires you to see failure as the ultimate learning tool. Success requires you to be disciplined and gritty and to never, ever quit on your dreams. I say all of that because one thing is certain, the road to achieving your goal is not smooth or linear. I wish it was, but it's not. It's gonna be bumpy, sometimes scary. Some days you'll take two steps forward and slide 10 steps back. And that's why success also requires you to know how to pull yourself out of a rut and get unstuck fast. Life is short. You can't be messing around with your goals. You've got to make progress every single day. So I've pulled a class from Impact Theory University called How to Get Unstuck, which you can watch for free with the link on your screen or by clicking below. When you join me for that free preview of that workshop from Impact Theory University, I'm going to teach you my strategy for how to understand exactly where you need to be going, how to identify the obstacle that's blocking you, and the best way to make the most progress towards that goal and keep your momentum. All right, click that link and let's get to work. All right, I'll see you on the inside. You do take a certainly a darker look at life than I do. And for some reason, I find myself completely drawn to that flame uh, of the way that you look at the world, maybe because it's good sort of disconfirming evidence for me. It doesn't just put me in my own loop. Um, but so the guy who people say, some people say that, you know, uh, Robert, you shouldn't write these books. This is like evil Machiavellian content. The world is better off not, you know, sort of turning a blind eye to this, um, which I heartily disagree with. But for that person to now be touching on the sublime, what drew you to that? Well, um, it's, it's I could go on forever about this. I'll try and keep it reasonably short, but I've been interested in this idea from 15, probably 20 years. It's, I don't know, I read an article, I read a book about it a long time ago. It really excited me. And I meant to be my fourth book after I finished war. I started researching it. And then I got um, disrupt, distracted by the 50 cent book that I did. Then came mastery and then came human nature. And finally I took a breath and said, all right, this is the time for the sublime. It's gonna be my next book. And the 18th chapter of the law of human nature is about confronting your mortality. And I talk about that, the sublime in that chapter. And the idea is that, here's how I explain the sublime. It's kind of like a circle. If you can imagine human life as a circle, social life. To be a human means in any time period, the culture that we live in creates a circle. And in that circle is a limit to what you're, you're allowed to believe in, what you're allowed to think your behavior. There are codes and conventions and rules that we all ascribe to. They're not the same as that they were in ancient Egypt 3,500 years ago, but back then they had a circle. It was just a different circle, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so 
you're not supposed to think these thoughts. You're not supposed to do this, this, that. This is the circle that we live in. Just outside that circle is the realm of the sublime. It's something that we're not really ever supposed to think about or we're not really supposed to ever do. It's something that's filled with a slight transgressive energy, a level of excitement. Because deep down inside in human nature, we don't like limits. We rebel against them. We want to be free. Our spirits are yearning to be free. And that sense of these are codes that you have to abide by is very restricting. It feels like a prison almost. So we're inevitably attracted to things outside of that. And that is the realm of the sublime. And it's incredibly exciting. It contains so much energy because in that circle, all of your energy is kind of crushed and compounded inside of you. It's kind of, you have to feel this, we have to do this. When you let go and you go out, explore outside of it, it's like suddenly you're tapping into something that's in the cosmos, incredibly energizing. It's what Maslow called a peak experience, right? Okay, so the ultimate form of going beyond that circle is death itself. Death is the ultimate limit, obviously, to our lives. And people who have peered through that door, because the word sublime literally means up to the threshold, mm. that's the Latin, up to the threshold of a door. So imagine that circle has all these little doors in it, and you're peering through it. This is something that I haven't thought of before, right? Um, the ultimate door is death, right? And people who've peered through that door have had a near-death experience a little bit, to some degree. It changes you. It's like that is the biggest blast of the sublime that you can get. That's the strongest form of the drug imaginable. You no longer look at being alive anymore the same way. You no longer see the trees, the birds, the, the people that you love in the same way. Do you Everything think it's is, universally that people see something better than they did before? No, it's not true. It's a good point. There have been studies of near-death experiences. I don't remember the percentage, but there is a percentage, the smaller percentage, that has a negative experience. It's very painful and ugly and demonic and hellish. And no, they're not having this. So thank you for bringing that up. That's true. But most people, for most people, it has this effect where, uh, and there are reasons why the people have the hellish view. There are other things going on. It's not, that's just not normal. Mm -hmm. um, is, you know, you're, you came very close to death and you're alive. So everything has a different meaning to you, right? Things that you took for granted before no longer have that same sense. And there are other things that go on. Well, anyway, the, to, to my story here, I wrote that chapter with those ideas in mind. And then two, three months later, I came this close to dying myself. Mm -hmm. So what had been this intellectual abstract argument about near death, sublime, blah, 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 became very real, right? I was in a coma. I was driving my car. If my girlfriend hadn't stopped, made me pull over. If the medics hadn't come quickly, I would have permanent brain damage or I would be dead. I came very close. I was in a coma. I didn't have like visions of, of you know, angels, etc., and all the other things that people sometimes claim they have. But I had some very strange things, some feelings in my body that it, not as often anymore, but I still sometimes get a feeling that my bones were kind of melting from the inside. Whoa. That was kind of like a sort of dissolving. What was solid about me was dissolving, right? And then a sense of, a very, it's only for a brief second, and sometimes I'm not even sure if it's true or not, but I had an image of me up above looking down, and I had, I had died, and people were talking about me, right? I'm not sure whether my brain in memory is playing a trick on me, but I seem to have that recollection. Anyway, it became very real to me, this subject, right? And so now, it wasn't just this intellectual arg arg thing about writing a book about the sublime, it was very, very real. The last thing I'll say is, when I had originally planned the book back in 2005 or so, I was going to be jetting off to Tierra del Fuego to see, you know, the, the, the South Pole. I was going to go swimming with dolphins in the Caribbean. I was going to be going on top of, you know, Mount Everest. I don't know, whatever, that kind of stuff. Having sublime experiences. Obviously, I had a stroke. I can't even really walk outside my house and take a normal hike. I can barely walk a few blocks. I can't do any of these things, right? So what I've had to discover is, because I can only write a book if I'm in the mood of the book, right? 
So I have to be feeling sublime to write the book. I have to find it in everyday things. I have to find it in the little garden in my house. I have to find it in the cats in my house, in my girlfriend, you know, and, and, how, and, and in her eyes, looking outside my window, in the books that I'm reading. I have to suck the sublime out of every little trivial little affair that I goes on in my life. And putting that in the book, I think, will... So if I had written that other book, people would go, oh, that's great, but this guy, this kind of rich white guy, he's able to fly off here. That has nothing to do with my life. I'm living as restricted of a life as you can imagine. There are people much more restricted than me, but pretty damn restricted. And yet I'm able to find this in my daily life. If I can find it, there's no barrier for other people, no matter if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's. Mm. The world is sublime and it's all around you. And you don't have to go to Tierra del Fuego to, to experience that. I wanna get more into what the sublime is actually. So I okay. honestly, it's a word that I never really thought of. Okay. I feel like I have an intuitive understanding that it's something sort of surprising and wonderful, but with a not sort of big, um, amplitude's the wrong word, but there's, there's something relaxed about it, like a, a warm bath is sublime, you know, but this idea of it being a threshold, something that you're seeing beyond into something new, that's a new take on it for me, which is far more interesting. Well, it's, it's the sublime is not a warm bath, quite the opposite. It's a mix of pleasure and pain. It's a mix of two opposing emotions, a sense of fear and a sense of awe, almost consecutively or at the same time right so if you go to see a horror movie or you're on a roller coaster the excitement comes from the fact that you feel kind of at risk that there's sort of danger there but you're safe right so you're feeling two things at the same time kind of anxiety and kind of about the pleasure that you're actually not being threatened mm. so neuro neuroscientists have shown that the mixing of two sort of contrary emotions creates an incredible intensity of affect, much more than just a single emotion. So the quintessential experience of the sublime when it was first written about in the 18th century was climbing uh, the Alps, the Matterhorn or wherever it was, right? And you got a sense of how small you were, how you, know, you could die very easily if there's an avalanche and how, you know, how fragile you were in the face of this immensity. And yet the awesomeness of it, the beauty of it was overwhelming. And so they were fascinated with this idea of being able to feel these two contrary emotions at the same time. So it's not at all a warm bath. Um, I can only, the, the sublime is an experience. It's hard to, it's something hard to put into words. So Robert's trying to write a book about it. Yeah, I know. Believe me, believe me, I know. But let me give you an idea. Give me one example of something that is so insanely sublime that you can't ever think the same about the world after you contemplate this. Okay, so here you and I are sitting here talking in this incredibly high tech, amazing house with all the insane technology around us. All right, consider this. Our planet's some 4 billion years old, around 3.1 billion years in some little bit of pond, some kind of organic life began. We don't know how or why or what triggered it, although scientists are getting closer. Some form of single-celled bacteria cr self-created itself out of chemicals that came from other planets, right? Carbon, etc. okay? This single-celled bacteria dominated the planet for billions of years. It was the only form of life, right? Okay. And then sometime in the past, I, I've forgotten the exact time frame in my mind. It's in my book. The first multicellular creature was created. Maybe that was 2 billion years ago or so. Okay. And it was a complete freak accident. One piece of bacteria swallowed another bacteria and created a multicellular organism. It's only happened once in the history of our planet, once. Contemplate that. Be we know that because there's only one line of DNA that we can trace back to the first time that it happened. There's not a second line of DNA, mm -hmm. only one. So it happened once. 
It's never happened again. It was a freakish example. If that hadn't happened, forget everything else that occurred on this planet. Okay, but it did happen. Okay, so these are called bottlenecks. Certain things occurred that created um, evolution to go in a certain direction, and they could have occurred differently. I'll skip to 60 million years ago <laughs> when a, an asteroid the size of New York City hit Earth, hit in, in the Yucatan Peninsula, and it was the most insane explosion ever, like the equivalent of all the nuclear bombs on our planet. It destroyed the dinosaurs. It destroyed 99% of the life on this planet, right? It was the Holocaust of all Holocausts. If it And this meteor almost missed the Earth asteroid. Very easily could have missed the planet because think of the emptiness of space mm. and the smallness of Earth. It was a freak accident. If that hadn't happened, dinosaurs would still be walking around here. Mammals would have never emerged as the dominant creature I'll skip to 80,000 years ago. Humans at that point, there were only like 10,000 humans left on the planet. Mm. If one single virus, I'm talking about Homo sapiens, one single virus would have wiped us out. At that point, we were extremely vulnerable. If that number had gotten down further, anything could have wiped us out, right? A change in climate, et cetera. Okay, if that had happened, we wouldn't be here. And Neanderthals would have probably taken over the planet. And who knows what that would look like right now, okay? Then think of your own parents and how unlikely was their ever meeting and, and the circus, the fate that happened there. If they hadn't met, Tom wouldn't be here or you'd be somebody else, right? There are 70,000 generations, more or less, going into you going back to the or, or first Homo sapien, all right? That one time encounter between you and your parents multiplied by 70,000 chance encounters. So to bring us to the present, that you and I are sitting here together in this office with all this stuff around us, it's you and it's me, the odds against it are so unbelievably astronomical that you can't even compute. So what does that make you think about the, what you, what's happening to you right now? If you really contemplate it, it will alter how you think about everything. Everything you see around you, the plants, the animals, they didn't have to be that way. It's extremely unlikely. It's a weird world that we live in, right? So that is an example of a sublime thought. It's a little bit scary because it has to do with annihilation, holocaust, deaths. But it's also an awesome thought about the fact that you're just alive. So that's, that's sort of, and it's something I went into in the second chapter of my book. I find this so interesting. So how how do we make use of that? And why is it so useful? Well, the reason it's so useful, and this is what I just did in my third chapter, is it's wired into our nature. So a lot of things are wired that aren't so good that we could talk about. But the need for transcendent experiences the need to be taken out of ourselves, which is the source of all of our religious, all of our spiritual beliefs, and all of our, the art that we create, almost everything that we humans do, goes back to our earliest ancestors, right? And being the first conscious beings on this, on this planet, conscious in the way that our brains are conscious, they looked at this world and they saw things that go, you know, I'm talking about Aborigines in Australia. How did this world happen? How did this occur? How could it be that there are stars and plants and kangaroos? It's insane. And right, and they had these kind of sublime thoughts. And out of that, they created gods and spirits and all sorts of forces. Okay. But that awesome feeling, that feeling of why, why are things the way they are? Why is there something and not nothing is very much wired into our nature. And to deny it is very painful. And so what I talk about in the book is if you're not going after the sublime, you're going to go after the false sublime. And the false sublime will be drugs. It'll be alcohol. It'll be joining some kind of ugly political campaign in which you get all your yayas out and you feel angry and violent and blah, 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 right? You know, on and on and on. It could be porn, you know, online porn, etc. Kind of drugs that take you outside of yourself but are kind of ugly 
and they're and they're addicting and they're not liberating. So if you're not going after this, you're going to find it in some other way and it's not going to be healthy. Mm. And you want this in your life because it gives you a kind of peace and it gives you a scale of priorities. You know, if if the Big Bang occurred some 13, 14 billion years ago and started this whole thing off, what does my little 80, 90 years of existence mean? This is like a flash. It's like a pop of a popcorn in, 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 this, in, in, in the eternity of time. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's so small. So why does it matter? So it's calming, actually. It's calming you down. It's making you think the things that are happening right now aren't as big as I think they are. So you want this in your life. Then you asked me, how do you get it? Is that your question? Yeah. So as you were explaining it, I thought mm, some people I think are going to brush it off. Maybe they don't um, stop to really let that hit them. And so when you were talking, I thought, OK, is this why? So I've never done psychedelics, but I have a feeling that whether it's a Zen Cohen, whether it's a psychedelic, whether it's using your ability to shape your own attitude to suck the sublime out of these simple moments, there's something to your point about we're hardwired for it. There's something necessary about jarring us out of our frame of reference right. that is if evolution has selected for it, there's something necessary maybe to combat our ideas calcifying into dogma, there's something in there that's critically important. And so I'm just curious for people that don't know how to suck the sublime out of the marrow of a simple moment, how they do it. Well, the how they do it is 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 through my book, I'm afraid. Because the, the book you haven't finished writing yet? Yeah, I'm only a <laughs> fourth of the way through. You give us tidbits <laughs> in in the daily laws. So I, do, I will I, I will do. thank you for that. Yeah, a couple chapters are in there. Um, the reason I say that, I'm not trying to hype myself, is there are lots of books written about the sublime, particularly in terms of art and in terms of like cultural history, but they're very academic. They're very kind of boring, which is very paradoxical because it's the last subject in the world that should be boring. So the book that I'm trying to write is in, obviously inspirational, but it's also very practical. So each chapter, the last section, I include exercises for you to practice in your life. They're going to make what I just wrote about actionable. And in the very end, I give you meditations, three things to meditate on every day that will make this part of your daily life, part of your daily practice, right? So I'm trying to make it as, as practical as possible. So, for instance, the first chapter is about the cosmic sublime, which is in the daily laws, about the Big Bang, about the origin of stars, about our own sun and our own planet and how insane all that is, right? And I talk to you about how you can have that feeling of the cosmos being created by doing certain things in your daily life. You can visit certain landscapes. You don't have to climb Mount Everest. You can just go to the nearest mountain around you, put your phone away, right? Leave that behind. Go alone if you can or bring somebody with you and you don't talk. Interesting. And just, just so you can think? No, just immerse yourself in this world. I've given you now pages of how unlikely it is that a mountain exists. I've explained to you where the mountain came from. I've explained to you how unlikely the birds in the sky are and how unlikely life is. And now you're, you're in it. And now you're seeing at night, if you, if you camp out, you're seeing the night sky. You don't have to have money to do that. You can go out anytime to the nearest mountain or hill and have that experience, right? There are other landscapes as well. Anything having to do with water. Water is the most weird thing if you ever think about it. Because as far as we know, we're the only planet that we know of that has the form of water that we have. And we're looking for other planets that have it. Form of water? Yeah. Well, there's no more water on Mars. It might be buried underneath underground. Do, or do you mean they have liquid, liquid water? They have liquid on it's liquid gas on Jupiter and Saturn, but they don't have our form of water. Mm. There's certainly a planet out there that will have it. But water came to us 
from from the sky. It didn't, it's not something natural to Earth. It came from rain. It came from comets and asteroids that left, left it here. These are molecules that aren't natural to our planet. When you're swimming in water, you're like inside of it. It's the only element. When you're in a mountain, you're not inside the mountain. You're not inside the dirt and the stone. But you're in water. You're in it. It's part of your body. It's incorporated in you. And to imagine the vastness of water. So the cosmos is this vastness, this infinity. Water is a, like a touch of that infinity. There's no beginning or end to water. There's no kind of limit to it. So I'm giving you these places like deserts that you can go to where you can have a touch of that. I also tell you on the internet, and I give you all the links, here's where you can look at things that, um, uh, what's that called? the Hubble telescope mm. has photographed. It is insane, the images that we can now look at. It is one of the most beautiful things about living in the 21st century. They have photographed a black hole. I describe in that chapter what a black hole is. To, it, black hole is something you can't even imagine, and yet they have photographed it. But just photographing the farthest reaches of our galaxy, the thoughts that'll inspire. So it is very practical, but you have to read my book. All right. If I were watching this interview back, I know I'd punch myself in the mouth. If I didn't go back to this idea of anarchy and there being elements of that that are good, um, tell me more. I, I have always had a default assumption. I will admit I have never thought about anarchy as having anything positive to offer. So I'm open minded. Br bring me in. Tell me why anarchy is well, is has elements that may be useful. Well, it's not anarchy per se. It's 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 change. I mean, so let's go to an example that I know very well, which is the French Revolution. It's something that I've studied a lot, and I'm very it, it excites me for some reason. And here you have a monarchy in France that has existed for at the time seven hundred years, very static, in control of France. By the time you arrive in the 18th century, it's kind of ossified into this very silly culture with Marie Antoinette and, and Louis XVI, where these silly rituals and these courtiers and everything. And, and the populace is suffering from famines and, you know, they're going, they're starving to death. And there's incredible inequalities of wealth. And it's basically a dead culture. And then slowly the fans of revolution start churning beginning in the early 1780s. There's some revolts against the, the famine, etc., and against the king. And then it explodes in 1789, right? And, you know, we, we're all more or less aware of what kind of ensued with the guillotine and the terror and how it goes way too far and it turns into something, a bloody nightmare, you know? Okay, and then after, the, after that falls apart, then Napoleon kind of rises to the top and he's sort of part of the French Revolution. And then he slowly turns it into something very conservative, etc. on and on and on. But the argument that most people have is, you know, the French Revolution, all that bloodshed, what, could, what, what was it for, you know? Why, that kind of anarchy, as you might put it, what did it lead to? What good was it? Well, it led to the formation of what became modern Europe. It led to the decline of all monarchies. It became an ideal. It showed the people of Europe, that there is another way of being. There's another way we don't have to live in these incredibly rigid cultures that, that, that were pretty ossified, like in the Austrian, Hungarian Empire, etc., or in Spain, that the ideal of revolution, which spread to South America, which spread, you know, of course, some of it was from the United, from the, our own revolution, which preceded the French Revolution. But other people have shown that the conditions before the revolution were actually a lot worse. The people, there were many more deaths and executions and suffering than after the French Revolution. So it was bloody, it went too far, it created a reaction. But in the long run, decades later, it had a very positive impact because it broke up this incredibly rigid system that it was strangling Europe, was strangling it culturally, economically, and politically. So that's an example of change that in the moment looks negative and bloody and anarchic and unruly, but in the end created a very positive effect. I'm not saying that happens all the time. It's not a law, but 
oftentimes what seems to be anarchic and ugly and awful in the moment does end up serving a, a higher purpose because we need dynamism in our culture. We need change. So because that sounds so horrendous, because all of us only have one life to live, and if you're the one living through the guillotine, and like I've heard stories about how absurd it got, where it had that sort of, um, was it in World War II where people were like clapping? Oh, no, it was I think it was in China, where people are like so terrified to stop clapping for, um, I think it was Mao, that, you know, they'd be there for like two hours, like just clapping, 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 clapping. And because you could get ostracized or killed if you were, you know, considered the first one to stop clapping or I've read the Gulag Archipelago and like the nightmare that it would be to live through that moment. And I get it from a macro perspective. It's like we want that change. No, no. So Robert Greene is going to tell us how to do revolution the right you way. Missed my point. What's the missed right my way? Point. Please tell um, me what I missed. So the Russian Revolution began with that. Right, began with these sort of peasant rebellions. But from the beginning, the Bolshevik Revolution was an incredibly conservative movement. It was not a revolutionary movement. It was a movement about amassing power for the state, for Lenin and the state and Stalin. It was a very repressive machine from the beginning. So it's not at all what I'm talking about. And the Chinese Revolution is very, obviously, an incredibly interesting story because Mao began with this idea of like the Trotskyite idea of a permanent revolution. We're going to have a culture that's constantly changing, et cetera, et cetera. And then it turned into this incredibly rigid, conservative, ossified culture. And I wrote about in The Laws of Human Nature, the cultural revolution in the 60s, in which he wanted to completely turn things upside down like what I'm talking about. So here I'm gonna contradict myself. Here I'm gonna show my own, here I'm wrong, Robert's wrong. Here was a chance, he wanted to turn everything upside down and it became a nightmare. And it turned into massive conformity, like what you're talking about, where you better keep clapping or if you stop, right? It turned into a nightmare. So that kind of just change for its own sake can lead to something very destructive. I don't deny that. And, and, and look what happened to China afterward. After a moment like that, they turned extremely conservative and rigid in the late 70s. And it's something that still affected them to this day. So, you know, history is not like uh, uh, this logical little thing like science or physics, where these things all happen the same way. I can pull up examples of change that lead to something very negative. I understand, I agree. And there are exceptions to what I'm talking about. In the long run, in the higher picture from looking from above, I'm more worried about cultures that are rigid, that are ossified, that cannot change, that don't have that kind of constant churning of the waters. And it's not just culture or, or, or politics, it's also business. It's also technology. It's also the ability to innovate. You know, social media was a great thing with the, the 90s, in the early aughts, we were all so excited about it, kind of the freedom of it, the ability to communicate with anybody. And it's turned into this kind of rigid me megalith, you know, like dinosaurs chomping around these giant brontosauruses that now dominate the landscape and nothing else can thrive, right? So that's kind of the dynamic where having something, it's not good for us. We want that we're the country, the country that that sparks all of the innovation, because that's what America is. We're a country of change. That's why Europe admired us. We weren't, hold, we weren't beholden to the past. We were willing to take risks and create new kinds of businesses, et cetera. So do you worry at all that we're moving to, with the PC culture, with cancel culture, all that, that we're moving closer to something like you better not stop clapping? Very much so, very much so. So, you know, and this is the way of all cultures. So we started off with a kind of a pioneer spirit where, you know, it's, it's the rugged individual and it's a kind of a culture where people can kind of be different and express who they were. And even in the 19th century, in, in a time very different from our own, where, you know, there were some kind of rigid codes of how to behave, there was incredible freedom going on. When you look about at, at some of the weird kind of... Um, cults that were forming the, the kind of utopian societies and some of the writers and some of the things that were going on. It was a, and even the business environment, which was very cutthroat with the robber barons, it was incredibly 
dynamic period of time where, where we celebrated the entrepreneur and we celebrated people kind of creating their own, you, you could, you know, the rags to riches myth that is so much a part of America. And we've really... You called it the rags to riches myth? Yeah. Well... Tell me more. Why is it a myth? <laughs> well, it's not a myth in the sense that it's wrong. Because myth is misinterpreted nowadays to mean false. It just means it was part of our culture. Just like Athena and, and Zeus was part of the Greek myths that people believed in. It was an ideal. Maybe that's the better word than myth. But it was part of what uh, held up where all Americans could reach for that ideal. Whereas in Europe, you couldn't, you know, sort of thing. So maybe myth was the wrong word. But, um, you know, and so... The reason I've written about this before, talked about it before, but the reason that was there that that started was we it was a culture that was hungry, that we were we we we, we felt um, we felt that there were risks out there that if we didn't do this that America was going to suffer something, that we we felt compelled to create new things, right? And you look at it in the arts and the sciences and technology. It was incredibly vibrant. And then you can kind of watch it slowly, slowly, slowly get get snuffed out. That spirit's kind of dying on the vine. And then Kennedy in 1960, he saw what was happening, particularly in the Eisenhower era. And he wanted to get back to that, what he called pioneer spirit. And he launched what he called the new frontier, which is part of the space race. And, That's you know, and the space race was what created the internet. If it wasn't for NASA, we wouldn't have the Internet. And the space race generated, I can't tell you how much of the technological innovation that, that powers everything nowadays. So, yeah, we're very much straying from that spirit with, with the cancel culture and, and everything like that. You know, so we're afraid of people with different opinions. We're afraid of, of things that threaten our own preconceived ideas. And that kind of, to me, runs counter to some of the spirit of our country. It's not, we, we're not, we've never completely lived up to our ideals, but that is the ideal that I think drove us for so many generations. Yeah, one thing I find just incredibly sexy is the idea of rugged individualism. Um, that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm with you, stagnation is bad change can be extraordinarily good change as a general element is incredibly important but when i think about the way things are going now where it's group identity over everything that really worries me and ultimately i think a group is only strong when the individual people are focused on like how strong can i become how much weight can i carry for the group and then the broader we make the group i think the better off everybody is but if you're not first leaning into like hey this is my sort of one shot at things. I'm going to see how strong I can get. I'm going to see how far I can push myself. I'm going to think for myself, act for myself. Um, that to me is where, one, you just get strong mental health because people are um, chasing fulfillment. They're pursuing things that fill them up in a way that maybe nobody else gives a shit about, but like they care about and they have the ability to pursue that. And then you marry it to an idea that we flirted with at the beginning that I think now is the time to talk about, which is mortality, man. Like, You've got precious little time on this planet, and are you doing something that you think is rad, you know, regardless of whether other people are telling you that that's what you should do? Like, is, is it something that fills you up? How do you, so I know you've talked in other podcasts about your book, so I don't think I'm talking out of school to say that you're working on a book loosely titled or maybe officially titled The Law of the Sublime and how that relates to mortality and the stroke that you had. Tell me more about that. How do you think about the fact that this is all finite, how does that tie in? Because when I think of sublime, I think of something so beautiful as to, you know, it, it's fleeting, it's beautiful, and almost painful in its beauty. Right. Is that close to how you think of it, or it is very, do you think about it totally? It's very wise, it's very intuitive of you. Because the thing about the sublime that I'm trying to um, capture the essence of in the book is that it's a mix of pain and pleasure, and that's what makes it so powerful. So the idea, that's really interesting. So the idea of our mortality is obviously very painful, right? What could be more painful? But the idea of transforming that into something beautiful, into something enlightening, 
into something that kind of fills us with a much different spirit, which which motivates us to get something done, which makes us appreciate what we can look at. We're alive and the sky is blue and, you know, and, the, and all that. So mortality has this ability to sharpen our senses, to sharpen our appreciation of life. And that turns the pain into pleasure. But the pain and pleasure always go together. So underneath that kind of ecstatic feeling that you feel when you're aware that, that you know, there's eternal time and that there are all these insanely wonderful things about around the world, is always going to be mixed with that tincture of pain about how I'm going to be gone and I won't be here to appreciate it. But that mix of the two emotions is what makes it so powerful and so insanely addictive, right? Because pure pleasure on its own can almost get monotonous and it can almost go, ah, oh, I'm tired of it, you know, I'm bored and pure pain. Uh, but the combination of these two things. And so in my book, I'm talking about how every element of the sublime has the mix of those emotions and why neurologically that is such a powerful thing to us. So, you know, people who've had ecstatic experiences, what Maslow, the great uh, psychologist called peak experiences. Let's say one of the paradigms for me is climbing a mountain right? Climbing Mount Everest. Or the guy who wrote that great book um, uh, about touching the void, Simpson, you know, people who've had those kind of mountaineering experiences. Mm. To get there, whoa, what pain, man. How awful. You can't breathe. You could die at any minute. There could be an avalanche. But you're so excited. You're so happy because you're alive and you're testing, you're testing your limits. This is known as the dynamical sublime, where you're testing your human endurance against the forces of nature and then you reach the top and you have this insane view that's like the paradigm of the mix of these two emotions now that might all sound kind of hoity-toity something very rare in life you know i'm not going to climb a mountain i'm not going to feel that way about death but i'm trying to bring it down to everyday things in your life so that the sublime is not just these rare moments where you climb a mountain or whatever it is, but it's in your everyday consciousness, right? That's the goal that I have. Because I think what people are missing nowadays is they don't have a sense of awe and a sense of enchantment about the world around them. They feel everything is kind of dead and everything is sort of the same. But the actual truth of it is, is that this world is so unlikely that you and I, Tom Billia, are talking right now over Skype about these very issues. 5,000 years ago, who could ever, it's impossible, it's insane, it's a dream. It's like it's not even real, it's like the matrix. Who could even begin to believe it? Every moment of your life is like that, but you're not fucking aware of it. You're so wrapped in banality, that you're not aware of the insane awesomeness. So my first chapter, which I finally finished, it was so difficult, <laughs> was about the cosmos and about the Big Bang and about the universe, and about the origin of stars, and how the moon came from the, the Earth um, about four and a half billion years ago, collided with this other Mars-sized planet called Theia. It was this giant collision, and the pieces of dust from that collision started spitting around the Earth, and by gravity, it kind of coalesced, and it became the moon. And wow, the moon is just like this dust that came from Earth, right? And then in the beginning, it was like much closer, like a third two thirds closer to earth than it was now it was like this thing that was right there in your face you know to see the origin of the moon and to realize that that is unbelievable and that the moon that i'm looking at now you don't have to climb out Everest. you can go out now and even in the daytime you can see the moon that's the same moon that people in ancient babylonia were looking at and so you're having the same experience that they're having you know you can time travel I do a lot of time traveling in this book where you can experience what it was like 5,000 years ago, 1 million years ago. You can travel through, through art. The Internet is the most sublime thing ever invented. Now, I'm writing this book. I have one little question about a dinosaur that I'm wondering about and how it, how it survived. I do three little, little clicks on my computer and, whoa, I've got all the answers. I have all these experiments. It's insane. I know recently you had a stroke 
And the way that you're approaching it has the sort of Milton Erickson written all over it with rebuilding yourself, but with a writer's mind. And so you're paying attention to what it takes and what you're going through. Yeah. Walk us through that. Like, what are you learning about that? What principles of the book are you applying to it? Well, um, you know, I, I hate to say it, but it was kind of a near-death experience um, because uh, I was with my wife at the time and she called the ambulance right away. I was driving, and if she hadn't called right away, I would have permanent brain damage right now, mm. and I probably would have gotten in, in a very bad car accident. I might not be alive. So, you know, the last chapter is a chapter about death, confronting your greatest fear in life, which is your mortality. I literally had to confront that. So the abstract words that I have about, oh, confront your death, overcome your fear, suddenly became very real to me. And so that was one aspect of it. But literally, you lose control of your body. I'm a very independent person, very willful. I like to imagine myself like I can do anything I want. And suddenly I'm put in the position of being a baby, dependent on people to clothe me, to feed me. I can't walk very well. I have no control over my left side of my body. I wasn't an athlete, but I loved exercise endurance exercise, not all of that wiped away. So what am I going to do? Am I going to start feeling sorry for myself? And so I applied one of the things in my book, which is, has to do with the last chapter about death, but it also permeates through the book, is just sort of accept things as they are. Stop judging. You know, I had to accept that this is a fact of life, and how can I make it into something strong? How can I turn this into a positive? I have a chapter on your attitude in life, mm. how you can change your circumstances by changing your attitude. Your attitude towards life will determine what you get. If you're avoidant and hostile towards people, a hostile person will tend to create hostility around him. So how can I alter my attitude? And it's a struggle every single day. I have to be incredibly patient, and I'm not a patient person. It takes me 10 minutes to put on a t-shirt to be able to get my left arm through that hole, that sleeve. Damn it, I'm not somebody who's patient. And I've had to develop patience. I've had to overcome all of these sort of negative qualities in myself. So if I talk in the book about overcoming your own nature, this, damn man, that was fucking slammed into my face, right? I had to overcome my frustration, my lack of patience, my willfulness, the fact that I always have to do things myself, you know, and then I had to confront the fact that I could easily have died, but I didn't, I'm alive, so I can learn from this. I'm learning a lot, and I'm going to rebuild my body. I'm going to rebuild it. I've come a long way, so like a month ago, I was pretty bad. I'm able to walk now fairly well. In four months from now, I'm going to be swimming again. In six months, I'm going to be jogging. I'm going to be back to where I was. Nothing will stop me but I have to overcome all of my deficiencies and all of these weaknesses that I have built up over the years. Yeah, that is, uh, needless to say, that's a, a long, difficult road. Um, how do you, or what tools do you use to reset your mind every day as you're going through this, in, in paralleling that maybe to the Chekhov story in the book, and how what he overcame, it was really extraordinary being beaten by his father all the time, um, and that he goes on to be the guy that isn't bitter was pretty extraordinary. Um, what mechanisms do you use to reset every day? I meditate every morning. I've been doing that for several years, for eight years now religiously. Um, and in those meditations, I confront myself. So I'm sitting there meditating, and my meditation is all about emptying the mind. But it's impossible to empty the mind. So as you're meditating, thoughts come to you, anxieties, worries, resentments. I've trained myself to question where they are. Each time I feel anger at my sibling or my mother or, or friend for saying something that I misinterpreted, I go, that's your ego speaking. You're, these people weren't saying something that was personal. You just have your ego, which is always getting in your way. Question it. So question my impatience, my frustrations, etc. The meditation has really helped me. Then uh, a, fr a, a friend of mine um, wrote saying about the stroke, well, 
look at it this way, that it's kind of an adventure, that you're having to experience things you've never experienced before. I go, wow. You know, I think I'm so brilliant, but I'm not. Sometimes people, other people have the best ideas. I'm always stealing their ideas. That was a great idea. This is an adventure. This is something new. I'm having to learn it. It can be exciting. Although, really, I'm feeling kind of bitter and angry. I have to confront that and move past it. The Chekhov story is great because Chekhov was born in, a, in Russia in the most miserable village in Russia, poverty-stricken, etc. Really cold and no, streets weren't paved and wild dogs ran through the streets and you could fall into a pothole and drown. And his father beat him every morning, practically. And his siblings were a mess. And then suddenly, they, two of the brothers ran off to Moscow. And then the father decided to follow them. And the rest of the family basically abandoned Anton Chekhov at the age of 18 or 16 in this miserable little town. And he had to fend for himself. And he, he started becoming really bitter, like, why, did I, why me? Why did I have this awful family, this horrible, abusive father, this mother who won't stand for her, up for herself, this drunken brother? Why me? And he got angry. And then he, he suddenly got sick of this story in his mind. And he goes, maybe I need to look at this totally differently. You know, I don't want to be like this the rest of my life. And so he decided that what he would do is he would try and understand his father instead of judging him. And he went through a process where my father was born a serf. We, we got freed later on, but he was basically a slave. His father beat him. He was never allowed to go into the kind of work that he wanted to. So no wonder he became an alcoholic who beat me. He can't help it. Instead of hating him, I'm going to love my father. I'm going to try and love him for this human being, for this fact of nature that can't help himself, but is my father for who he is. And in that moment, he had a total epiphany and transformation that by getting rid of his negative emotions towards people, he was like free. He was liberated. And I've experienced this myself in my meditation. To go through just an hour or half an hour of freeing yourself from all your negative emotions about people, it's as, almost as if you're going to fly in the air. You feel so light and suddenly you've gotten rid of all of your burdens, all the things that are weighing you down. Accepting people and loving them for who they are is an incredibly liberating thing. Now, you can't do that for everyone. Some people are so toxic and ugly that you're never going to reach a point where you're going to love them. But you can understand them. And in understanding them, you don't have to internalize that the pain they inflict on you. This is, he changed his attitude towards people and towards life, and it changed everything that came to him later on. He became a successful doctor and later a great writer. The two, the brothers had the same reality, the same world that they were looking at, the same family. One looked at it through this prism of empathy and love. The other looked at it through resentment and bitterness. The one person, Chekhov, got famous and successful and, and a fulfilled life. The others just descended into suicide and alcoholism. So your attitude is, will mean what you get in life. You, know? you will sabotage yourself with your attitude. So if I got all bitter and railed against fate for making me who I am, for the stroke that ruined my life, that took away everything that I value, I can't travel, I can't drive, I would become a different person. I would become somebody who limited my scope of activity. But by accepting it, by saying, I'm not going to let this happen, I'm going to accept it, I widen my scope of activity. I do things that I normally wouldn't do if I became all angry and avoidant and anxious. Amor Fati. Yes, exactly. Tell people what that means. Well, it's a Latin expression that literally means love of fate. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's, it was created by the... German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who's one of my great icons in life, one of my favorite writers. And basically his idea was that we humans normally go through life kind of not accepting things. We want things to be different from the way they are. We want to have a better wife or husband. 
We want our children to be better. We don't like the political system. We want this sort of utopia to suddenly come about. We want people to be different. We want this, we want that. And to Nietzsche that meant you are anti-life. You are against life because life isn't like that. Life is a series of facts. Life is what it is. We've evolved a certain way. Your reality is a certain way. It is what it is. And by pushing against you hate life. You want to love life. You want to love fate. And what fate means, things happen to you you can't control. You didn't control who your parents are. You didn't control what city you were born into, what school you went into. You didn't control whether you were born rich or poor, right? There's much you can't control, that's fate. Accept it for what it is. Stop whining and stop going, I want something else. Embrace your world, your life. The, our fear of death is probably the greatest influence on our behavior th throughout history. We're the only animal that's conscious of our mortality. And it's caused an incredible reaction. We're avoidant, we're anxious. We invent an afterlife, a heaven where we'll all go, right? Or today, we never see death. We never see people die in hospitals. We never see the animals that we eat being killed. We have no confrontation with death personally in our life completely disconnected from it. It makes us anxious and fearful, and that controls everything about our behavior. We become anxious and fearful about everything. So the ability to accept death and look it square in the eye and accept this is your reality, that you're not going to live forever, is very liberating. So amor fati is a step from turning your back, that's faced this way, going, here's life, and oh, I hate it, I don't want it, blah, 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 to turning around and facing it, going, I accept it, I love it, I embrace it, and it has a very powerful effect. Let's go a little deeper on that. So with your recent, essentially, moment where you couldn't help but look at death, what have you learned, what have you taken away from that? Knowing um, as a writer, you have shown time and time again that you see things that are often counterintuitive. So what, what was it in that maybe that even surprised you? Well, the experience itself, on a physical level, was very weird because I didn't experience the stroke as it was happening. It was almost an outer body thing. So my wife noticed I was acting very strangely. My whole body was weird and everything. And then I blanked out and I was basically kind of in a coma or not conscious for about 10, 15 minutes. Oh. And, um, and then I was taken out of it at the hospital, and I kind of freaked out. Like, what's happening to me? Where am I? What happened to my body? So it was a kind of a weird out-of-body experience that I think I'm still kind of recovering from. The other thing was, um, I did a book with 50 Cent called The 50th Love, and I hung out with 50 for several months. He's a great guy. We're still friends. 50 had an even worse near-death experience than I was. He was shot nine times, very close range, bullet went through his jaw, he came this close to dying. And he said, and I've noticed it in him since then, that nothing can faze him after that. How can he be afraid of anything in life once he came that close to death? So he has this kind of Zen calmness that I've witnessed. You don't think of 50 as being zen and calm. You think of him as this angry, kind of thug-like rapper. But in real life, he's an incredibly calm person who never seems to get riled by things. Well, I've had a little bit of that effect myself. Um, so I've noticed the people around me, like my mother or other people, they're all freaking out about what's happened to me. Oh my God, we've got to keep, he might fall, he might do this. We've got to and I, I don't care really. I, don't, I feel calm. I feel more calm than I felt in a long time. So that was kind of a counterintuitive thing that I wasn't expecting. Now is that because you feel like there's nothing left to take away, now every day is a gift, or um, what, is, what is the calmness born of? It's definitely that, and then it's definitely, it helps the fact that I've written, this is my sixth book, the loss of human nature was sort of like my ultimate, I like vomited out of me everything that I had built over the last 20 years. 
you know, this one book, all the things I've learned, all my anger, I got it out into this one book. So if I die, I don't have, to, I don't have any regrets. You know, I, yeah, I'd like to write a seventh and an eighth book. I have other ideas, but I could die and I, I'm okay. I lived a great life. And I talk a lot about that in Mastery and in this book, that the worst feeling in the world is to be facing death and to think, damn it, I've wasted my life. And I want people out there to realize that if you're 20s and your 30s, you don't want to reach that point. You don't want to waste your time and become 55, 58, have a stroke, face death. And what have you done? Nothing. You've moved from job to job. You tried this, you tried that with half an energy. You really have nothing to look back on. That's the worst feeling. So, you know, I don't have that problem, I don't think. So that's part of how I'm able to stay calm. But the other thing is you say, bring it on. What worse can happen? I've already experienced it, you know? I'm somebody who has a great deal of fear of death, and now I had to deal with it. So, eh, it's all right. It's not that bad. I can handle it. When Infotech merges with biotech, what you get is the ability to uh, create algorithms that understand me better than I understand myself.